Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm talking with Marcos Pratchett about medical astrology, consultation charts, and prognosis and prediction in the context of astrology. Uh, so, hey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Hi. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. So, I'm excited about this episode. This is going to be a good discussion. Um, so, let's talk first and introduce you to my audience. Um, so you have a background and specialize in Western herbal medicine and medical astrology with a focus on horary astrology in particular, right? Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> yes. <That's>, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you ha- you come partially from the lineage of the, uh, like the Olivia Barclay school of the qualifying horary practitioner course, right? Yes. Although I'm kind of self partly self-taught i started off the sort of modern astrology with the lsa london school of astrology who are great and i i began with them uh and then i sort of got interested in traditional astrology sort of around 2005 6 uh i really got into horary first really through reading john frawley's books uh, which you know they're, they're great very controversial figure john frawley but a brilliant astrologer and um, so I sort of became, I, I, I went in traditional astrology, really just sort of self-taught uh, for, for a while. Um, and that was just a number of different factors, like the, the, the school, the, the class times weren't really, I couldn't really do the classes because I was working and whatever. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, I mostly sort of like partly, so officially school taught with my beginning in modern astrology and then the, the traditional astrology sort of self-taught really. Cool. And, and that you were able to combine that in some ways also with your interest and focus on herbalism. Yes, exactly. And that, that was, that was the major incentive for me actually learning astrology in the first place. Cause I was doing uh, a degree in Western herbal medicine at Middlesex university. And in sort of 2004, I came across a book by Graham Tobin, um, who is an, a brilliant astrologer and also a brilliant herbalist called Cool Pepper's Medicine. That I would I would recommend to everybody. It's 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 a brilliant book and it just sort of gives the life history of of Nicholas Cool Pepper, the sort of maver- maverick apothecary of the 16th century, uh, who was also an astrologer. And sort of reading that book just opened my eyes to how pivotal astrology is in the history of uh, of me- medicine in the West. Um, mm-hmm. particularly, of course, traditional forms of medicine like herbal medicine. So um, that that really inspired me to, to learn astrology in the first place. Okay, brilliant. And so since that time, you've, you've been using it um, in your work and incorporating it. And one of the uses that we're going to talk about today and focus on is um, consultation charts, which is Sort of like a it's it's a subset of either inceptional astrology or horary astrology, depending on how you look at it, where you cast a chart for the moment that a a client comes to you for a consultation or or to ask you a question about some specific thing, and the chart will describe not just the the nature and focus of their um, inquiry at that time, but also potentially the the outcome, right? Yes, exactly. And I, I think I think you discussed this in 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 a in a podcast you did with. Dr. Lee Lemon a, a while ago, um, at the sort of hierarchy of, of charts in traditional medical astrology, where you know you'd you'd have the birth chart, which is for a whole lifetime, and then you'd have a decumbiture chart, which is the chart for the time a person first gets sick, uh, and then you'd have a consultation chart. Really, a decumbiture and a consultation chart can be used interchangeably because they're both charts that describe a moment in time that sort of um, a pivotal moment in a sort of the story of a person's relationship with a disease, if that, if that makes any sense. So the, the issue with decumbiture charts, if you can get the decumbiture chart, the time a person first falls sick, then that's great. But in most cases, it's not available because people don't happen to sort of fall over and look at the clock most of the time. I mean, you can, there are substitute t- charts you can use. So for example, if somebody gets given a significant diagnosis during a doctor's appointment, you might have the time of that appointment. Or if somebody gets admitted to hospital, then they, the time of admission to hospital can serve as a decumbiture. But the chart that you as a practitioner always have is the consultation chart. Uh, and, and so there's a distinct practical advantage there. The other practical advantage being that you can 
always look at that chart for your own R and D as a practitioner. So, cause I'm primarily a herbalist. Some of my clients come to me and because they know I do astrology, they, they, they want me to look into the astrology specifically, in which case I can use their birth chart and any other charts. But a lot of the time they just want the herbal medicine, but I'll often look at the consultation chart just to get a bit of context and, and see, see how that unfolds. So, so it's, it, and obviously that's a chart that you don't need to, there's no, there's no privacy issue there. You don't need to ask for those details. Right. That makes sense. And that's interesting in terms of also like the, or it makes, makes me think of, of the origins of horror and one of the things that be, became clear about it in some of the earliest references to it in Dorotheus, that they were always dealing with trying to use the greatest moment of symbolic significance or importance, yes. but that sometimes if you don't have your ideal moment of importance that you can use, there's a series of like lesser charts that are somewhat more far removed from yeah, the prim- primary exactly. one as, as sort of a backup. So in Dorotheus and Hephaestu, I think they said, um, if a client comes to you um, when something has happened, ideally use the cast the chart for the moment that the event occurred, and that'll be the inception chart for that moment, and you'll use that. And then they say, um, if you don't have that and you don't have the time for that moment, then use the time for when the client first found out about it, when they first learned yeah. of the event that it had happened. But if that isn't present, then use the chart for when the client comes to you asking the question. So I guess we're kind of dealing with a similar hierarchy here in terms of how you're approaching this as well with medical events. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think what, what's interesting to me about astrology in general is that these things, although astrology can be compartmentalized into all these different specialisms like medical and electional and whatever, the principles, the guiding principles are are, are, are the same throughout. So I kind of, as a herbalist, I visualize it as a plant in a way. So like literally we call the, birth, the, the, the original chart, the radical chart, and that's often used to refer to birth charts, but a radical chart could be like a decumbiture, the first chart in a sequence. And then following charts are almost like nodes on a stem or something. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, the root is the radix. And then as it's sort of growing, you've got these other points, these, these significant junctures in, in, in the, in events, which you can sort of do a little cross section of and analyze. So that's, that's what all those charts are. They're, they're cross sections of the same process or sequence at different times. That's how I think of it. Yeah. I love that. That's really smart. And, and so um, the consultation chart, I mean, the decumbiture is when the person first gets sick or, or, is said to take to their bed ill. And I want to ask yeah. you a little bit about that and what, because there's always been some ambiguity for me about what to focus on with that. But I like how you're framing that because then the client coming to you as the astrologer is one of those important junctures when they've come to you to seek counsel and, and advice, basically at that point, that is an important symbolic moment of, of juncture for them. Exactly. And, and I think you can really take any significant moment in in a timeline and 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 make a chart from it in the same way that you know say in in a relationship you could take uh between two people you could take the chart of the first contact between those people the chart of their first date the chart of their wedding the chart of the birth of a child you know these are all you know, ideally, if you can get the first meeting chart, going back to what you were saying about Dorotheus and Hephaestio and those original sources, obviously that's going to give you the whole, you know, the whole thing will telescope out from there so that that, that radical chart will tell you the story of the whole thing. But any of those sort of inter, those charts at those different junctures will, will give you a snapshot of what's going on at that point and from that point also just using the planets will be in different positions. The symbols will be slightly the same, but it will tell you the story. Nevertheless, that's, that's what I find anyway. But. That makes sense. So there is a, a primacy that's given to things that are chronologically earlier or first, and they have yes. a sort of primacy. I'm trying to think of a better word for that, for anything that follows after, but that doesn't necessarily mean that subsequent moments of importance cannot act as their own sort of root charts in some way for everything that follows subsequent to them. 
that's a really lovely succinct way of putting it yes i think so and 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 i think um each chart will have its own things to say because they'll talk about the context of that moment as well so so yeah yes <laughs> yeah cool all right i love this so we're, we're talking about nexuses and moments in time and those important nexuses and the chart for that moment being able to, to speak to that moment as well as mm -hmm. potentially to a little bit about the past and what led to it and a lot about the future and what comes subsequent to that so that then leads into our discussion which is um, traditionally one of the ways that astrology was used um, especially in the medieval period in the renaissance was it was integrated as a diagnostic tool sometimes in medicine and many medical doctors, um, astrology was sometimes used in medicine as a, as a diagnostic tool to figure out what was going on with the patient, um, especially, you know, because they didn't have things like x-rays or, or other sort of diagnostic tools back at that time. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And no, I do. I, it's funny you use that because I, I do often think of medical astrology as the sort of medieval x-ray. I, th I think in fact, you, that, that, Dr. Lehman may have said that. So I I, <laughs> I, I love that analogy. Um, the sort of the, the medieval x-ray. But it, I mean it's a bit more than that, isn't it? Because I, I think astrology is is fantastic for giving giving context. So modern medicine zooms in on the details and astrology sort of um gives gives a broader context, but with less granularity, perhaps. Um, but the, the, this met this may be. I, I don't know. This is just the way I think of it. Like, you know, if Mercury is the planet of astrology and mm -hmm. the planet of the human mind, the sort of the connector planet, the as above, so below planet, I think of um, modern medicine, biomedicine as being like Mercury and Virgo and its exaltation and rulership domicile, because it's really strong in Virgo because Virgo is the sign of the analysis of small things, you know, that the cold, dry nature of it, the sort of coldness, the sort of sticking with it and the dryness of pulling things apart. It's the ultimate sort of um, analytical dissecting mind. And then astrology is like Mercury and Sagittarius. It's kind of it's sort of in its detriment in the sense that you you can't be sure always that the information you the prediction or information you've got is is right because it's kind of like trying to look at a tundra a vast landscape through a microscope you know that the human mind can't really encompass all of the possibilities that one can see in a chart but um it's still nevertheless got utility because I, I, I'm, I'm not among those who believe the planets in detriment are useless. I just believe they're harder to work with. So <laughs> but, sure. um, yeah, it's yeah. giving a much bigger picture view because it's also incorporating things like timing that may not be in an X-ray, let's say, but the astrology yeah. chart while also maybe describing something about the situation as we'll get into later may also be telling you some things about the sequence of what's happening to the native or what will happen to them at that time. So it has a temporal component, which is one of the things that makes astrology really unique, even as a form of divination, which if, if, if it is a form of divination, which is something I've been thinking about a lot lately is I've been suddenly for some reason becoming more interested in tarot and how that works in its own terms, but understanding the ways in which astrology may be similar to tarot, especially in applications like horary, but also is very different because it has that temporal component that is sort of objectively occurring out there in showing the sequence of events sometimes uh, in a very weird way. Yeah, no, that's interesting. This this could be a whole massive tangent, Chris, because <laughs> right. I, I think about <laughs> I think about this sort of divinatory, like what is divination a lot. Um, in fact, I, I put it, I snuck a little bit in, of that into my book on chocolate. Like there's a little chapter mm. in there where I talk about divination because one, one of the, this is, this is not a fully formed grand unified theory of divination, but it's just some thoughts I have in it. It's kind of like, I think what I, if you look at all the different methods of divination, be they sort of tarot or I Ching or astrology or whatever, astrology being, I, I would agree, the sort of apogee, the sort of most elaborated and sophisticated method, arguably, um, they all combine this abstracting of chaotic in the chaos theory, kind of random sense information mm. from nature um, into a more organized system so it's kind of like you've got to have some sort of chaotic element and then the organizing system is the human mind it's like the 
<laughs> this is circular logic, but like I said, if Mercury is the symbol of, of the human mind and the as above, so below, it's kind of like the, the actual mechanism of divination is this mind machine, this, this, um, this mental structure that you create and the ingredient, it has to include some sort of chaotic element from nature that is then abstracted and put into a system. Uh, so that's yeah. one element of it. So, so, so yeah. The for so what fortune are... component of chance uh, yes. and that it's taking a natural phenomenon that looks chance-like or, or random or chaotic and is like the shuffling of the cards or the throwing of the yeah. coins, which is a random chance-like outcome. But then from that part of the premise is that the outcome and what happens at that moment, the way the cards are pulled or the coins fall is actually contrary to what we would expect in it being chance. Like the outcome is actually purposeful and meaningful. Yeah. Yes. I'm sort of saying that, but I'm also saying that the, 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 the so with astrology, for example, we know that the Zodiac isn't actually made of, you know, that, that, for example, that, that the signs are really, they don't exist in a literal sense. Do you know what I mean? In the sense that the, the sky isn't literal. So if you're talking about the sidereal zodiac, the sky isn't divided into constellations of exactly 30 degrees each. If you're talking Whoa. about the tropical zodiac. It's, it's, you've sliced up the sky into those 12 segments. So what I'm saying is it's, you've taken that natural information and then you've codified it. And, mm -hmm. and and sort of so it's the the actual lens through which divination occurs is sort of like a mind machine that you've made in your mind <laughs> does, sure. does that make sense i mean yeah, yeah. potentially i mean the it gets tricky with it <laughs> at least with the tropical true. zodiac because i don't want to touch on the sidereal since that's no, outside sure, sure. of my own focus but the at least with the tropical zodiac you have some objective astronomical phenomenon of the solstices and the equinoxes, and then it's being divided and equally into 12 segments. So it's something well, I'd, say, I'd say you do with both. You do with the sidereal zodiac. I mean, it's, it's, it's roughly positioned, pinned onto the constellations, be they of different dimensions, it's still pinned mm. onto them, but you still got, there's still an abstraction and the houses for goodness sake, that's literally just slicing the sky into 12 segments. I mean, whatever method you use, there's, I mean, you can come up with a metaphysical, rationale for that but at the end of the day what you're doing is imposing a, a, a sort of you're imposing a structure on that now you can make the argument that, that structure is divinely ordained or that it's you you it, it's being channeled in some way but I, I i would say that all forms of divination have that sort of um random chaotic information so random in quotes that is then codified and i think it's the codifying structure it's like an it's like a mental antikythera. It's a mind machine that you make. And one of the big arguments that I, I have often is that um, one of my one of my 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 bugbears as an astrologer is don't mix the methods too much. Like if you're using sidereal astrology, use that toolbox. If you're using Western astrology, you'll use that toolbox. It doesn't. It's not to say that you can't necessarily pick tools from different boxes. But in my mind, you're kind of you're using these different laboriously constructed mind machines that have been created over thousands of years and those are the prism through which that divination works um I, I, yeah it's, it's it's really hard to articulate this stuff I, I wrote a whole chapter on it in my book and i spent ages like trying to get the thoughts down because it's sort of like trying to nail down water a little bit it's, it's, it's slightly above my pay grade in terms of my cognitive capacity all of this stuff but um sure <laughs> but yeah i understand yeah. what you're saying though in terms of it's a uh... You create a system, and then once that system itself has been established, um, then within the con context or the boundaries set by that system, once established, the divination can take place, and the answer can arise through that, just within the context of the internal structure and logic of whatever system's been created. Yes, and 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 there's, there's there also seems to be some some that there has to be that combo of the slightly chaotic and and that includes things like you know diviners getting physical in, in, with depending on methodology i always think of the mesoamerican calendar calendrical systems of divination which are still sort of in use in 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 sort of various maya um sort of uh, regions in in central america now where they've kind of got this really codified 260 day ritual calendar 
and they've got these sort of divinatory systems of sort of counting beans or seeds out to represent days on that calendar. And then the diviner selects those with that, with a sort of intuitive, with a feeling, like they call it the lightning in the blood. They'll get a feeling that's like, oh, that's the right answer. The same as a tarot reader does when they pick a card. Oh, that's the card, you know? So there's all, it's anyway. <laughs> and right. I, I guess, I guess astrology has that to some extent, but far less than the others, which is what makes it arguably, which is what makes it um, very interesting. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. and maybe going back to your point about astrology being associated with Mercury, that's one of the problems is that it always has one foot on each side, on, on either side of almost every issue. And, and I've always thought about that as that might be one of the issues that sets astrology apart because it does have that divinatory component, but it may have some other naturalistic or, or quasi-objective component as well. Um, but anyway, but that's a whole, whole topic in and <laughs> yeah. of itself. So let's, yes. <laughs> let's get back to our main focus, which is, um, consultation charts and, um, medical astrology. And so one of the points that you made is that consultation charts then are one of the most accessible because if somebody comes to you and they don't know their birth time, or let's say they don't even know their birthday or birth year, you can always cast a consultation chart for the moment that a client comes to you. And that's going to speak to and say something about that moment, what the client is focused on. And um, in some instances, what the the outcome of that situation will be. Yeah, exactly. So all, all, all of the above. Um, I mean, I, th- I think, I think you've summed it up there, Chris. <laughs> okay. I, think, I mean, that's, that, that's basically it. I mean, I, I like them, as I say, just because they're always accessible um, and they are, they're interpreted in basically the same way as you would interpret a horary chart um, where the the ascendant ruler represents the querent or the sick person. But there is a little, I don't know if you want me, me to get into that now, but that there is there is some some controversy there because different traditional sources had had different rules for that. Um shall I go ahead with that now? Because there's um Sure. Or one question I had was to clarify the decumbature thing if you want to first, or we can come back to that later of like, what is the moment of quote unquote decumbature of, of taking, you know, the, the traditional yes. sources call it like yeah, taking no, that's, to that's one's bed. Great question. Yeah. 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 Cause everyone's like, well, well when, <laughs> when does right. that happen? Cole Pepper talked about this in, in his, um, his amazing sort of medical astrology book, which I'd recommend anyone interested in medical astrology gets because it's a very slim book which takes a lifetime to understand or you know because it's it's so information dense uh, it's, it's the snappily tr- titled astrological Ju- judgment of diseases from the decumbiture of the sick um but it's it's great and one of the things he said about the the decumbiture and i'm paraphrasing because i don't have the book like in front of me um was it's not the time when when the when the person feels the first smatch of illness or the first mild little headache, it's the time when the person first gets so sick, they have to lie down. So for that, you can take, uh, if you have it, and many people don't, if somebody's at home, like the time when they first go to bed or, or whatever, but what often serves more practically for most people is the time of a hospital admission or the time when an ambulance is called or something like that. So you don't need to think about being so oh god when was the very first moment that i got really sick it's more about when was a really important nodal moment in in the in the beginning of this sickness so so as i said you can use the time when you get test results as well so say you've just had some tests done or the time of the test themselves if you have the time of the the um a, an important scan you can use the time that you had the scan if you have that or the time that you got the test result there's there's so, so the traditional meaning is when you lie down, when you get so ill, you have to lie down. But practically speaking, you can use any of those significant moments as inceptional times. Okay, got it. And that goes back really far. I mean, I remember there's a very short chapter in it in book nine of Vedius Valens all the way back in the second mm. century. Um where I think it's in chapter six and it's titled Horoscopes for Illness, the Initiatives. And it starts by saying the determination of forecasts when a patient takes to his bed must be made in the following way. Um, so this is a pretty old sort of approach in terms of casting decumbiture charts. 
Mm, that's really interesting. That's really I've I've I'm I'm slowly plowing my way through Valens. I have to say I I got stuck on the on the on book I think two. <laughs> so okay. Far. Just like read, reread, reread. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's tricky because the translation that's freely about out there right now, it doesn't have charts. There's diagrams, images in it. And when he describes a chart, you're supposed to have a blank chart and draw it up, or ideally yeah. in in the book have it right there. So that's something I hope to fix in the near future, but it's one of the things that makes it, makes it harder to read that translation of Valens right now. Um, okay. So that's decumbature charts, but, um, and, and in a decumbature chart, if you're casting a decumbature chart, going back to the first house issue in most forms of electional astrology, the one that initiates the action is assigned to the first house or whatever is initiated or born in that moment in the same way that in a birth chart, the first house represents you primarily the native that was born at that time and the other houses represent other people in your life in relation to you in a decumbature chart um is the first house the person who falls sick at that time yes although asterisk there's a little caveat there so yes for the most part in a decumbature chart or a consultation chart because i say for the most part you interpret them the same the ascendant and so, or the first house and its ruler represents the the patient but there are a couple of of, of little quotes here so i've got them on a little bit of paper um one was this is from the centiloquium of hermes so it's a traditional collection of traditional astrology aphorisms it says when thou shalt be interrogated for a father behold the fourth house for a brother the third a, of a son the fifth of a wife the seventh but if for a sick person behold the ascendant only so that's hermes so that's old old sort of text like i don't know what what century is that chris you'd probably know that one um, um the syntelochium oh of hermes not of not of ptolemy i mean it's probably like medieval yeah. so eighth ninth tenth century let's say okay roughly. okay so then the next quote though is somewhat in sort of counterpoint to that would be from william Lilly's um christian astrology uh, I think book two, that sort of horry book in, in the chapter on on uh, on the sixth house, obviously. When a urine is brought, so this goes back to the Renaissance thing of they cast a chart for when the physician received the patient's urine, which if you think about it is exactly like when you receive uh, test results today, medical test results, or or mm. when the doctor opens the file, the patient's file or something. When a urine is brought, let the ascendant represent the sick party, whether the querent come with consent or no, for the urine was sometimes of the essence of the sick. So what you're saying there is if if you've you've got something from the patient, then the ascendant represents the patient. The, patient, the person <laughs> if, that it's about. Yes, exactly. Because it's okay. I'll boil this down because I think there's a really key point in here. If no urine or consent of the sick party come to the physician, then the ascendant represents the querent, but the person and sickness must be required according to the relation the querent has to the sick party. A man for his servant, the sixth, shall, shall, shall show his person, not his disease. That must be from the sixth to the sixth, which is the 11th, etc., where no consent is. What, what he's saying there is if you've got, if the, patient has given consent like you know that they've they've said yes to you uh, looking at their medical details then they are always the first house if there's no consent so if somebody has come on behalf of their friend or in william Lilly's example like on uh, on behalf of an employee of theirs a servant then you can't use the ascendant as as the sick person because the ascendant will be the person asking the question um, you would you would use so this happens most often um, in in practice. I find nowadays when a parent comes with their child, and the child is not able to give consent because they're too young. They don't really you know they can't. Children generally can't give consent. So you have to look at the chart carefully because if the child is old enough and knows what's going on and kind of then they might be represented by the first house, but usually the first house will be the parent who's brought the kid to the consultation and the kid will be the fifth house and the ruler of the fifth. 
and the chart should make that plain because you, you you can sort of see which one is is having difficulty um yeah. so um, it really just goes down that whole issue of of um the first house representing the one is initiating the action and going back exactly. to that whole whole framework and either the patient themselves is coming to you and asking and initiating the action by posing the question or um, in some instances, if there's somebody that is just acting as a representative of the the client and they're passing the message along on their behalf. And well, no, here's where it gets tricky though, because <laughs> if if the person they're passing the message along from knows that they're they're coming in their stead, like right. so, if 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 it's a if it's a some person with Lily's example coming for his servant for an employee, if that employee is given his boss a mandate to go and see the physician, then they would still be the first house because right. they are the ones ask, actually asking about their own health. They're doing it by proxy, but right. they would still get the first house. It's only when there is no, the key word here is consent, when there's yeah. no consent. So that's, so it's, it's, it's a combination of the two factors that, that the thing that the point that you flagged up, Chris, about the, uh, the initiator of the action plus consent um does that make does that make sense yeah i was just where i was going with that was just it's the difference between um somebody asking on behalf of their let's say boss with consent versus somebody asking about their boss like will my boss die okay. in which case they are the querent and the boss is not they're, they're not conveying an action on behalf of the boss would initiating the question they are as their own interested and subjective party asking a question and therefore become the first house and their let's say 10th house or what have you ends up representing their yeah, their per boss perfect. or their employee exactly, exactly right I, I i cut you off prematurely chris sorry about that yes so that's, that's okay that's, that's exactly it sounds right. like we're on the same page though and and it, so it really has to do with um just who's initiating the question do they have consent or are they acting as a representative of the person directly and deliberately in that sort of like chain of uh, yes, or, or sequence exactly. of things versus are they just acting as their own, you know, interested party from their own subjective perspective. And and, and then that's when you, you obviously that doesn't happen that often. You have to be a bit careful about that ethically and mm -hmm. perhaps even legally, because, you know, why are they bringing you some medical question about someone they know without consent? I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to be a bit careful about that. Uh, so. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Or let's just say in a, let's say a non sketchy context, they're asking about like, <laughs> yeah. you know, their girlfriend or their partner or boyfriend is yeah. sick and they're wondering, not asking on their behalf, but they're just worried about them. And they ask like, will they get better from this? And in that context, they're the first house and they're asking about their seventh house party, let's say. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that happens sometimes if, if you've got somebody whose friend is in hospital or, or whatever that does, that does happen. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think that sets up the framework pretty well. And one of the questions, and I don't know if it's time to get into this now, or if we should circle around to it later, but um, the whole, you know, very easy and simple discussion of fate versus free will. And, uh, <laughs> you know, what, when you're doing a sort of medical type consultations or medical astrology, um, two of the questions you wanted to address is how much is a prognosis set in stone and how much mm. um, to share with patients and clients? Is that is a good time yeah. to get into that? Or is that? Yeah, it's, yeah, because it's kind of like that we've got a few charts to show, and these will all sort of come at those questions from slightly different angles, really. Just um, I mean, yeah, so so the first one was, was sort of how much is it set in stone? And and that um I have no uh, my 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 supposition at this point in time is that fate is kind of like a, an elasticated five-dimensional web <laughs> so we're, we're all enmeshed within it but um as 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 you pull on it it pulls on you so so we're, we're, we're there's some movement there's some freedom of movement there's some you can change the way i think things show up and you can change the time frame but nevertheless there is 
there is a there is fate going on. You you know, if some time is going to be difficult, then it's going to be difficult. But perhaps the way that it shows up and something of the time frame can be altered. So there's an I think there's an elasticated element <laughs> to, to to fate, um, which which may be partly dependent on. I can't remember all the traditional Greek terms, but you know, there was agnoia. Was agnoia the term for ignorance? And mm. uh, and then. What was the, is it was it Hamar Mania or, or am I getting that that wrong? You're 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 good on these terms. I'm, I'm I I tend to they tend to fall out of my head. But there, there was a basically if you're not ignorant, which is that the, the sort of ancient um, sort of understanding of astrology was a way of antidoting ignorance and sort of if you if you applied it, I mean obviously that the Stoics would think they thought fate was very set and your your the astrology was there as a kind of remedy to help you. Um, what's the word sort of adjust yourself to it or acclimate to it mm -hmm. um, so that you're not as, as, as shocked or, or, you know, carried away by it. But I, I, I personally think in a more, I suppose, broadly neoplatonic way that yes, there's fate, but it's somewhat adjustable and, and uh, we are playing a role, an active role in the co-creation of that fate. Um and the, but 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 my thoughts on this are evolving all the time in practice. The more sort of charts I do and and and, and clients I see and so on. And then the, the second sort of element to that was um, uh, sorry, Chris, it's getting it's getting late here, so my brain's sl slowly turning to soup. What was the, what was the second question? Uh, the other one was just um, in terms of how you know sharing with clients and patients and how. Maybe one of the questions that I, I see astrologers sometimes debating and, and there being tensions over and different practitioners come to different places about how blunt to be with a client in terms of yes. what they think yeah, the got it. outcome will be. Thank you. Yeah, this is a really tricky one because um, it really, there's a sort of moral dilemma here for the astrologer, I think, in the sense that say you do a chart and you'll see there are some of these charts coming up, which were, you know, very tricky situations to say the least. And, and a client has asked you to sort of look at the astrology of a really difficult situation. And um, maybe sometimes it's not great. It doesn't, it doesn't say great things. So what do you do? I think my approach broadly would be to tell the truth but always to, without, without sort of being Pollyanna about it, without sort of, you know, lying, <laughs> uh, give them a, the most sort of positive inflection or spin on it. But again, without telling, without lying. So, so if, if, if there's a, a chart, say somebody has a, has a very difficult, perhaps potentially terminal illness and, and you've done a consultation chart or a decumbiture or whatever, and the chart suggests a, a, a worsening of the situation, you might then look at what other factors in the chart could mitigate that. And you might look at what possible timeline that might be over and what might, and what might be the upper limit of that timeline from the sort of elasticated window perspective. But then you've got to also consider, will it help this patient being told that? Because that is a huge consideration because I've had patients or clients or friends even who have massively benefited from astrology. Like there's, there's one later on in, in the charts we're going to be looking at today who, who emailed me later on a uh, cancer diagnosis, very difficult situation, and who credits the astrology with, with saving her life. She said this, this was so useful because she was in such a dire situation. The astrology sort of gave her a framework and said, no, this, this could be going, you could, you could survive this for longer than you think, and it could go on. Uh, but there are there are other patients who I've done astrological readings on in the past who have have felt really worried by them. And you've got to be careful that what you're saying, particularly if it sound, is negative, isn't taken as a curse and that you're not putting things into people's heads, which could, you know, act as a nocebo, uh, you know, to, to induce a, a bad medical reaction. So I have no easy answer to that but that that the, what i try to do what i usually aim to do in practice is be honest with what i see but also just skew it towards the most constructive interpretation possible and i can do that without being a faker because 
I am a neoplatonist, basically. I do think that we participate in how our fate shows up. So this fate, I bet fate, I believe, is at least somewhat modifiable and and certainly experientially it's maximizable. Like you can you can certainly experience things. Things always look different on the ground than they do from the air. And it's always the same with astrology. You can look at some upcoming directions or transits or whatever and think, oh my God, it's going to be terrible. But then when you're on the ground, maybe it is terrible, but it's it's terrible in a whole different way than you thought. And it's 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 very different. It always looks and feels different when you're inhabiting the map, so to speak. So it's sort of like you don't want to inject any existential dread into a client. You want to be doing your best to remove it. So, so that often it, there's, there's a mixture. It's like, I think Lily said mixed dis- discretion with art. That's like the best way to put that. I think. Sure. I think it was Lily um, who said that I might be misquoting, but I think it was Lily. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's full of good quotes like that. So I'm sure yeah, yeah. there's something close to that, but so, so on the one hand, I don't want to say this, so it's good. At least, you know, this is something you're, conscious of and and in being conscious of it and trying to exercise as much caution and in trying to not do any harm to the client, um, you know, it's not something where somebody, let's say some skeptics might accuse the astrologers of, you know, if they're being really uncharitable, um, the worst case scenario, not considering those things or not taking into account the possibilities of of inducing, like you said, a, a nocebo, the opposite of a you know, positive placebo yeah. effect. Um, so, so that's something that's really important and just in terms of being conscientious as a practitioner. Yeah. And then with respect to the other thing you were saying, I guess, since you're working with a symbol system, um, there is a certain amount of flexibility or malleability in terms of um, the potential outcome that you have a range of potential outcomes once you've read the symbolism of the chart, but that there's probably you know, a worst case scenario in interpreting that symbol. And then there's probably a moderate scenario and and a best case scenario. So one of the things you're saying is just that while still interpreting the placements within the context and the constraints of the symbolism, you're still wanting to lean a little bit more towards at least saying, you know, what some of your best case scenarios are given what's shown up in the charts. That's beautifully put, Chris. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and I think we see that in in life all all the time. <laughs> I often say that water finds its own level, and and that's for both good and bad. And and what I mean by that is, you know, we see this with as astrologers with clients all the time. You might be sort of giving them sort of saying, "Why don't you d- this? Your chart has this aspect. Why don't you do this thing?" And they're like, "Oh, I'm already doing that." You know, like water, people find their own niches, but they also find their own vices and ruts, you know, ruts and niches. <laughs> so water finds its own level. You tend to find that the that the astrological symbolism will show up in both difficult and constructive ways. And our jobs as astrologers, I believe, is to maximize the constructive manifestation by signposting those potentials and directing clients towards them. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Okay. Um, And that, you know, I think that approach goes all the way back to to Ptolemy, because while some of the other astrologers during that time period in the first couple centuries CE in the Roman Empire had more of a stoic approach that the purpose of astrology was just to find out what your future is, so you knew what to accept ahead of time, um, Ptolemy, who had more sort of Aristotelian tendencies, uh, used explicitly a medical analogy. And he said that, you know, sometimes with astrology, if the person isn't conscious of, of the indication and does nothing, then yeah, the astrologically expected outcome will be what mm-hmm. manifests. However, if the person becomes conscious of the possibilities and makes an effort to either counteract or, or counterbalance them or, or change things in some way, then they may be able to change the trajectory of things even if only slightly and that that counts for something so so yeah. part of your your philosophy i feel like goes all the way back and has that lineage going all the way back to the 2nd century and I've, I've, prob- I've probably absorbed it by osmosis I, I'm, I i don't think i'm quite as diligent a cataloger of these things as you chris so i sort of magpie them together over time i think 
na- yeah. nat- native Jupiter and Gemini. So, <laughs> so, so that's yeah, well, what it's tends just, to happen. It's, uh, you, well, that influenced so much of the subsequent astrological tradition through Ptolemy that, you know, there's mm. just, that is the oh, root definitely. of which there have been branches and, and hundreds of branches of different astrologers and practitioners, the medieval and Renaissance and modern periods that have grown and expanded on that philosophy. Um, I was just sort of tracing it back to something I have reference to in the area that I specialize in more, whereas others might. No, it's fantastic. On. It's, it's, it's really good. I mean, it, it and it, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it probably does originate from there. It's sort of, yeah, it, it goes back to that sort of thing about the, 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 the antidoting ignorance thing, you know? So, right. yeah. Yeah, as well as our earlier discussion about um, nexuses and, and and roots, and you know, going back and everything, doing the same thing, but just in terms of <laughs> yeah. the history of astrology. Um, okay, so time frames and severity; those are part of really what the potential is that's important here to be able to identify in what's unique potentially, and to be able to identify sometimes in addition to outcomes with the astrology and with um, things like consultation or decumbiture charts. But those are potentially modifiable factors is one of the important take-home lessons for you here? Yes, definitely. Uh, well, um, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> it's probably, yeah. probably more accurate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so shall we get into example charts at this point or are there any other preliminary yeah, matters no, I, that I we think haven't... that's that's no that that's great chris because i think other things will probably all, well certainly come up as we do the charts so so yeah okay all right so i'll share on the screen now the first example chart that you sent me and so just to describe a little bit what we're looking at for our audio listeners we don't have to describe the whole chart but just the relevant pieces One of the things we're looking at, so we're looking at a chart with 26 degrees of Taurus rising and 25 degrees of Capricorn on the midheaven, and you're using a a quadrant house system using Regio Montanus. Is that your preferred house system is Regio? Yes, for the for the medical stuff, absolutely. And I I can describe a bit about I can say a bit about why in in, in a moment if you like. Um, Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just. It's because um, I, I try to have a reason for using that that the, the quadrant houses that I do. I do use the whole sign system as a sort of as a background in my thinking. In other words, whether something's visible from the ascendant or not, and if something's in the tenth sign, it will say something about career or in medical context about medicine in general. But I like the quadrant houses for 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 this because they 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 shift the co-rulers of different houses around a bit more, um, which, which is really important for, 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 for prediction. I, I, I like that. In terms of why I use Regio, uh, and this is just my own thinking on it, it's because it divides, first, firstly, it's from tradition. So, so Lily used it and the, the English sort of um, Renaissance mm-hmm. uh, astrological bods all use that system. So, okay, that's, that's one reason. But the second reason I like it for medical is because it's dividing the sky based on projecting the equator onto the sky, sort of like slices up the equator into 12 segments and projects it onto the ecliptic. So that's like projecting the body of the earth onto the sky. So for medical astrology, particularly if you're using it for looking at physical stuff to do with the body, that conceptually makes more sense than using Placidus or or some of some of the other systems which are dividing up time, you know, their arcs of time. So I, I do I use Placidus, for example, with, with with natal charts for some timing techniques. You know, there's a there's a, a technique from I think Lily used it for horary, but I think it works perfectly well in in birth charts where you use five years per house um, as a sort of and counting, I think, anti-clockwise from the ascendant. And uh, and that works better with Placidus houses. <laughs> so because it's a timing, it's a Placidus is a division of time. So so in terms of the way the, the, I like there to be a, a sort of metaphysical rationale as well, as well as just a historical precedent for, for why a particular quadrant house system might be used. So, so those are my two reasons. Um, but, yeah. That makes sense. All right. So let's go back to the chart. Um, what are the other, just in terms of relevant pieces for the audio listeners that we have to mention up front when it comes to this chart? Right. Yeah. Just because this chart was the chart of a child. So going back to what we were saying earlier, the ascendant 
with the sort of 26 Taurus was the mother. But okay, we're so, looking at the fifth house and its ruler in this chart. So what was the question or let's give it, what was the setup? Okay, so the, so yeah, no, it's a good point. So so this was a consultation chart, and this was uh, just a consultation at, at the the university clinic I used to I used to teach at Middlesex University, um, and and the 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 mother had brought brought her child in, and the child was the patient. But obviously, the the, the child was very young, um, and couldn't therefore give consent. So the right. ascendant represents the parent, and the fifth house and the fifth house ruler in this chart represents the child so the um, child wasn't like hey mom let's go see an astrologer i have a horror, horror question to ask surprise surprisingly not Chris. surprisingly no, yeah 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 Shockingly. Uh, but but it was more the the mother came in and ha- happened to have the child with and the question was about the child but it wasn't well, well, this asked. this wasn't even a, this wasn't even a question this was literally the consultation chart so this was the time the consultation began uh, okay. and this was this was at the university clinic so I, I i wasn't doing astrology at the clinic they'd have they'd have had me burnt at the stake or something so you know i was literally just teaching herbal medicine so right. i would usually note down the start times of consultations and just have a quick look at the chart on my phone or whatever for my own r and d uh, and and just to sort of uh, get get a little bit of astrological insight into the situation when i could um, yeah. because I was there to teach herbal medicine and to sort of, uh, as, a, as a clinical supervisor, not as an astrologer. But uh, so, so this was the chart of a consultation uh, in which the mother brought the child. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm constantly, I'm constantly writing down times and um, meeting times and, and yes. taking a screenshot of like charts for when, when consultation or, or some sort of thing like that happens. So I know what you mean here. And so that was this scheduled ahead of time or was it like a walk-in client it, this was most of them was that that's an interesting side point you you so getting onto there chris because most right. of the met consultations are scheduled ahead of time so people mm-hmm. have a couple of questions i've got is like does that not invalidate the charts and i'm like well no because it's that patient who's booked in at that moment and and very often patients will turn up 10 minutes late or 20 right. minutes late or yeah. five minutes early and you get a different chart. You know, it's, it's really crazy how it works out. So people get the right chart sort of thing. Um, yeah. but, and but you can see also, that constantly with just like meeting charts of like, you're supposed to meet up with somebody and it's scheduled for this, but then it gets <laughs> delayed and it ends the rising sign changes and it ends up putting a malefic like angular and then it's up being like a terrible <laughs> yes. meeting or it doesn't yes. go well or the opposite it you're supposed to mean it's scheduled and like mars is going to be right on the ascendant and a day chart and it looks like a terrible chart but then they end up being 30 minutes late and it switches signs and all of a sudden jupiter's exactly. like on the on exactly the head and it goes exactly fine. we, you, we you actually get... had that today oh really uh what? yeah with our with our chart because <laughs> i i'm going to share well what happened is our chart um i we had scheduled this and um i scheduled it for just due to different time constraints and we were going to do cancer rising today and what i was shooting for was just putting jupiter on the midheaven based on Ah, some other things i was going for um jupiter on the midheaven at about 19 pisces here with cancer rising and because somebody might otherwise initially look at this chart and think you know, it's Cancer rising, and the Moon is in Scorpio, Scorpio in the with the South Node. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fall, which is not really a great, great place for the Moon, even though it is in the fifth, let's say, whole sign house, which is a good house. Yeah. Um, but due to daylight savings time, which of course is like the bane of astrologers um, in <laughs> many locations, <laughs> yeah. uh, we ended up being an hour late. And what happened is it switched. The Moon changed signs, and so we still ended up with Cancer rising, but the Moon moved into Sagittarius in the sixth yeah. whole sign house, which arguably, like if this is a hoary chart of a question, is more descriptive of what we're actually talking about, which is medical astrology. And sometimes when medical questions come up, finding the ruler of the ascendant in the sixth house is not you know, surprising necessarily because the focus of the, the question or the inquiry is on health and, and illness matters. Yeah, fully. It's 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 and and you know it, it may even be a little better in a way because like the moon's applying to trine of the sun in Aries or or something. Um, yeah. 
But it's, it's interesting. It's just like what we were saying beforehand. Oh, it's it's Mercury's applying to conjunct Neptune. What's going to go wrong? So, yeah, so you, you kind of like, you kind of warned me a few days ago. You're like, we'll we'll see how it goes. I or you said, uh, you know, there'll be some tech, tech issues or something, issues. something, something. Because yeah, but it's fine. It's like it's just you know, it's it's the way it goes. But it is funny. You do end up getting the charts that you're quote unquote supposed to get right. So. I've had yeah. that where I've carefully constructed an, ele- an election and then it's just like it's it, things go wonky and you end up with a different star or something. something so. yeah. yeah. So, but that's a really important point that though, that sometimes even in scheduling things, if the schedules allow for the two of you, for your trajectories to intersect at that moment yes. and they're not set off course by either having to go early or go late or you know, sometimes being canceled altogether. Sometimes the best laid plans get completely canceled for reasons outside of your control. But if you're able to, your paths are able to actually intersect at that time, then that was the moment you were supposed to meet. And there will be something about the chart of that moment that will accurately describe the nature. It's it's like it it never stops working, eh? Like we're we're all inside the belly of the beast, or for a slightly less like ominous metaphor, sort of in inside the body of the universe or something, something. But it's mm-hmm. like we're never outside of it. So it's like that old astrological argument about d- does the fact that there are more induced births now invalidate birth charts? And and mm-hmm. I'm my money's on no, because mm-hmm. <laughs> because we're all inside this system that's everything's corresponding to everything else constantly if if astrological doctrine is is in any way valid then that you know that there's those links don't stop working uh right but it, it's an interesting it's it's really interesting it's an interesting discussion for sure so yeah and that just brings up the the last point which is just that one of the things that's so startling about horror and also about consultation charts is that the chart when you cast it for that moment will describe that moment and what's going on at that time in sometimes startling ways. And that's one of the things, again, not to dwell on it too much, but to bring it back to the tarot thing recently that as I've been paying attention to that over the past few months, I've been startled at the extent to which it actually has described things that I've been thinking about or questions that I've had in that moment. But that just reminds me of a phenomenon that often happens in horror that I would see over and over again, where the ruler of the ascendant would end up being in the house that was under question. And mm-hmm. that was often an easy confirmation that the chart was accurately describing things and it would be good to rely on is when the chart itself is describing uh, what yes. was happening in that moment. Definitely. And, 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 you know, the other factor that I often belabor a bit when I'm teaching is, is context is everything. And, and that context is internal and external. So internal means within the chart itself, as you were just describing, the chart will often you know, really tell you if it's talking about that, you know, it's, it's like, I don't think astrology ever stops working, but for those issues that are really plugged in, that are really important, <laughs> uh, or even minor horary questions about where's my missing handbag, but if it really matters to the person at the time and they've, you know, it, it's going to show up, the chart will describe it really, inter- so there'll be internal context, but then there's the external context about at any given moment, there are a billion different things happening. There's a dog being born, a toaster being plugged in, somebody's lost their shoe, someone else is moving into a new flat, another baby's, you know, whatever, loads of mm-hmm. things happening. And that all of those events will have, if they're in the same location, will have the same chart. So the context means you read the chart differently for each of those contexts. So which is one of the reasons I think why many of these sort of statistical studies of astrology, which I think are very useful actually, but fall rather flat and say, oh, there's nothing to it. Because you're, when you read a chart cold without context, you don't know what level you're plugging into it. It's it's only when you plug a chart into a particular real life set of concerns that it becomes animated because only then can you sort of pull focus and zoom in on particular levels of the symbolism and know what you're looking at, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it does bring up, and not to get a, on a whole side debate, but I, I, do feel, <laughs> I do feel like when it comes to that, that debate sometimes about horror, that if there is a really important question that has a lot of emotional charge for the person, um, there is a, often a greater likelihood of that chart really vividly describing the situation as well as its outcome. Whereas I feel like sometimes if a person was 
not invest in a question or was just asking something repeatedly over and over again to different mm. astrologers or something that there might be less um, of a uh, charge behind it and less likelihood for that chart to very vividly describe both the question and the outcome. Oh, de I know de definitely. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Different different practitioners like fall no, in different no, places. No, no, I agree, that, Chris. So. I call that the perished elastic effect. You know, mm. so so you know, like you just keep asking the same thing. It mm. sort of gets bag. John Frawley wrote about this in 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 I think one of his books, uh, it, books on horary, uh, which which I, I as I say, I think I think I think are excellent. I, I certainly, you know, I, I don't. I, I am aware that he's somewhat controversial, but as I say, I think he's brilliant. Uh, at, and as an astrologer, he's wonderful, and his teaching is very very didactic sometimes but very precise and one of the, he talks about that phenomenon if you keep asking the same question over and over eventually the charts will still show you something but they'll just start showing you like you know when your grandma's coming to tea or something it'll, it'll stop it'll stop really giving you the question because it's no longer it's no longer a significant it's no longer a significant time you've kind of yeah something something along those lines right. it's fascinating like maybe, though it's really interesting how it works maybe an analogy could be like watered it down or something like if you had a, a, gl a glass of like let's say red wine versus um if you keep putting water and like putting like half water and watering it down and then you put another half of a cup of water in it and then eventually it's like there's a little bit of wine in there but it's mostly are you, water are you arguing point. against homeopathy chris no. <laughs> oh right yeah <laughs> I know, I'm gonna get... I know, no i know i think it's a good analogy i know what you mean it's like it's something like that for sure i mean but it's anyway it's it's a fascinating question so yeah all right don't uh homeopathy twitter do not cancel me for this <laughs> I, I, hope... I, did, chris, I was just being facetious he's not arguing yeah. against anything at all. Yeah. okay all right so back to um the example chart so okay here it is so she she came to you and what was the consultation so this, about this was really uh, i mean it's kind of a dark chart to open with but basically this uh, um her child very young child had a terminal diagnosis a very a very rare kind of cancer so um this was a client a herbal medicine client so they were coming for uh obviously with the knowledge of their doctors and the medical team and the oncologist just for some support for the child who's going through yet another round of chemo just to make them less nauseous and able to handle it a bit better and just improve their their general health and quality of life and everything um so i had a look at this chart and i was looking at the fifth house because that's the house of children and i say children can't give consent so they can't be the ascendant and the fifth house uh, in this Reggio Montanus quadrant system has 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 14 degrees Leo on the cusp. And so its ruler would be the sun in Sagittarius, right on the cusp of the eighth house. Um, and also the 26 degree Taurus rising, that 26 degrees Taurus uh, is where Algol is, this fixed star that implies sort of losing your head. It's it's a it's a very difficult star. It's a star of Mars and Saturn, sort of inflammation and and potentially potential death. Now, it also symbolized the, 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 the mother's state of mind, I would think, because this is this is her, her child who is very sick. So obviously she, she was very unhappy about that. Uh, anyway, so, so just in terms of prognosis from this chart, I would look at the sun as being the child and the moon as the general significatrix of events. And I, I use, for, for sort of general uh, prognosis, I tend to use this uh, system from Masha Allah, um, his his uh, book on reception, which is translated, I think, twice to my knowledge so far into, into English. You've got Robert Hand's translation and also Ben Dykes um, has done a, a brilliant job translating it in, in his works of Sal and Masha Allah. But the, the point about this um, book on reception is it gives a really clear uh, and helpful way of sort of seeing how things are likely to move forward. Uh, it says, take the significator, um, so the ruler of the ascendant, or in this case, the sun, the ruler of the fifth, and does that planet behold the ascendant? Is it in a sign which is in any aspect to the rising sign? In this case, the sun's in Sagittarius, and the rising sign is in Taurus. So in, in terms of the traditional 
whole sign aspects, it's not aspecting the ascendant. It's not beholding the ascendant. So in that case, Masha Allah says, you would go on to prefer the moon, assuming that was beholding the rising sign. So in this chart, the moon is in Leo and the rising sign is Taurus. So the moon does see the rising sign because it's in, in, in sort of square by sign to the rising sign. So right. in terms of and just to oh. describe the placements for the audio people, so yes. the um so 26 the Taurus rising, on. the sun is at 25 Sagittarius, and it's actually right on the cusp of the eighth quadrant house in Regimontanus. Um, the ruler of the ascendant Venus is at 10 Aquarius in the 10th house, and the moon is at zero Leo in the fourth quadrant house. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So so in terms of so I would look what happened to the child in terms of the child's general experience to the sun, because that's the ruler of the fifth. So I would just see where the sun went from here, but I would look at the moon as what's going to happen overall, because the moon has more power in this chart in the sense that it sees the ascendant, whereas the sun doesn't just based mm. on that Masha Allah technique. So I'd actually take the timing of sort of improvement or, or, or deterioration from, from, from the, from the moon. So, so what happened uh, looking at the sun first, the sun is at 25 Sagittarius and uh, it moves, it, it actually goes into, it moves on into Capricorn and then it casts a sextile to Mars, which by then in this chart, Mars is just at the end of Aquarius. But by the time the, the sun actually sextiled, Mars. Mars was in Pisces. So the sun moves into Capricorn, sextiles Mars, and then Mars in Pisces crossed the south node and then eventually went on to square Saturn. So that to me showed an initial improvement because the sun sextiling Mars from Capricorn, and this is why Masha Allah's work is called On Reception, in Capricorn, Capricorn is, is the sign of Mars's exaltation. So he would have said Mars received the sun from Capricorn. So that would negate any harm that Mars might cause. And then Mars went on to square Saturn from Pisces without reception, which would indicate a, a more difficult sort of more difficult developments. So from that, I would think that the child would get some some improvement in their condition, perhaps through martial means that might be through um, surgery or radiation or, or drugs. Mars in this chart ruled the um, seventh house and is in the 10th sign in the 11th quadrant house, but the 10th sign Mars. So, so the seventh house is the house of physicians or in this chart, it would be me, but it's also uh, doctors in general. And the 10th house or, and sign are, are related to medicine. Mars also has some rulership of Capricorn on the uh, the 10th cusp. It's it's uh, it's kind of one, I think it's a co-almuten of Capricorn, which means that both Saturn and Mars have a lot, have a, have a lot of strength in Capricorn. So um, anyway, so the sun went to Mars with reception. And then Mars went on to square Saturn without reception. So that showed an initial improvement, perhaps through drugs or treatment. And then Mars goes over the south node, which is a bit weakening, and then squares Saturn, which could indicate difficult uh, things. And then in terms of the specific timing, the moon in Leo is going to oppose Venus, which I take to be a, a temporary improvement, temporary because it's an opposition, improvement because it's Venus. And Venus here wasn't the main ruler of any of the difficult houses. She is a co-ruler of the sixth house because Libra is intercepted in the sixth. But here Venus is in the 10th and ruling the first. So, so I would say that would be a temporary improvement rather than anything else. And then I think Venus went on to, was it trine Jupiter, which you might think, oh, that's great. But in this chart, Jupiter rules the eighth house. So I thought that might, given that we've already seen or that I'd already suggested that the, the sun went to Mars and then Mars went to Saturn, I thought that might indicate potential um, death in this circumstance for around 10 months. And I remember at the time, this, was a, this wasn't an astrological client. This was just um, a, a mother who brought her child and 
gave herbal uh, advice and whatnot. Um, I remember writing this down on a little piece of paper and just thinking, is that, is that, and just, and, and, and 10 months later that the child unfortunately did, did pass away. Uh, and what actually happened was that they got some treatment, herbal, herbal treatment from us, which, um, she reported helped the child's symptoms a bit and made them feel a bit better. And then, um, they went to see, cause I said at the university, it was a student training clinic. We didn't have, um, all the time necessary to research the, the amount of research that's required for cancer patients is huge. Um, so I, I suggested a couple of other herbalists, um, who specialize in complementary oncology. And I, I think, um, she took, she took the child to see them. Um, and, and they did, they did pretty well in terms of, in terms of, um, sort of getting some improvement, but eventually things, things took a turn. And, uh, and this was a child, as I say, with initially a, a terminal diagnosis. So it was really sad, but just looking, the chart was so eloquent, um, and, and things in this case did just unfold as, as, as predicted, which, which is not fortunate, but it was, it was interesting to see, to see that happen. Yeah. So this was, it wasn't, um, you didn't end up giving her astrological advice. You just noted no. the time of the consultation and, and your only input was herbalism, but were fascinated by the extent to which the chart was able to time things. And were you getting mm -hmm. the 10 months from the number of degrees between the moon and Venus that the moon's application of Venus is yes. 10 degrees so, away? So I think what Yes. So I've sort of got the, the, the digest of this on the slide because I couldn't remember it. So the, the, it was, I think the moon opposed Venus within sort of 10 degrees. And then I think Venus moved an additional 10 degrees to try and Jupiter. So the moon was in a fixed house and sign. So that might've been sort of 10 months to some improvement. And then Venus was in, um, I think, a, 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 another fixed house and sign. So that'd be another 10 10 months to, to possible, uh, death. So I think that's where it can, uh, well, I think, I think, yeah, it was just the Venus moving 10 degrees in a fixed house and sign 10 months to possible death. That was, that was what I, I, I thought I obviously hoped I was wrong, but it, it turned out that in, in this case, that's, that's what happened. And I, as I say, in this, in this chart, I preferred moon to Venus, Venus to Jupiter, Jupiter ruling the eighth house to the sun, because the moon can see it beholds the ascendant. So according to Masha Allah's rules from on reception, the, the significator that sees the ascendant will give the timing more accurately um, than, than the one that doesn't, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, I thought it was, I don't, you know, there, going back to our discussion previously mm -hmm. about um setting up the, the the in divinatory system setting up your rules and then following your rules i mm. think usually it's like that the hori, whatever rules the hori practitioner goes into the consultation with will be the rules that work um and so i don't want to not uh, second guess or reanalyze your thing here but something i noticed um was just when i first looked at this i thought the cusp of what's actually the sixth quadrant house was the fifth but that's partially mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm also looking at in the whole sign framework and just noting that Virgo is the fifth yes. sign relative to Taurus, the rising sign. And then the ruler of the fifth sign is Mercury, which is um, not just conjunct Pluto in the chart within two degrees at 14 Capricorn to 16 um, yep. Capricorn. But Mercury is actually also stationing. It's two days away from stationing retrograde in this chart. Um, which is a, another really not good indication. Yeah. Oh no, no. There's, 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 there's loads of indications in this chart, whichever way you slice it, there's, there's some, you know, so you've got the sun on the cusp of the eighth, right. which goes to Mars, which then goes to Saturn, the rule of the six houses, you say conjunct Pluto stationing retrograde, the moon going to Venus and then Venus going to the ruler of the eighth house. It's, 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 it's fascinating because all of it shows sort of maybe not the Mercury they all sh seem to show some temporary improvement and then a turn for the worse or something along those lines. That's, that's, well, at least that's how I interpreted it. Was that? Yeah. So yeah, sometimes there can be just multiple indications that are all pushing in a certain direction or sort mm -hmm. of saying, or, or in some instances, like screaming the same thing, um, per perhaps in a single, single chart. Yeah. I'd agree with that for sure. Okay, here's the animated. So I just had moved it forward two days and then saw 
Mercury stationary there. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. I mean, the, the rule of the sixth house stationary often means a disease that isn't shifting mm. and retrograde means relapsing or reverting. So absolutely. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Let's go to our second example chart then. So here it is. Can okay. you see that? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so this was a, a, a client, um, much less um, s- s- severe, and this was a client who came to see me privately and was interested in in looking at the astrology. So, so I had had a much stronger sort of mandate from this client to discuss the astrology with them, uh, and uh, this was a client um, from 2013 who had ongoing sinus problems, chronic sinus problems. Um, so we've got. 12 degrees cancer rising and the ruler and i should say nine degrees pisces on the mc the ruler of the ascendant is the moon at 13 degrees of libra and the moon is actually void of course in this chart uh she's not making any further aspects in libra and then when she changes sign into scorpio trines venus at three degrees pisces in the ninth house and then venus goes on to square jupiter at seven degrees gemini on the cusp of the 12th so again i was sort of just looking at the relay in terms of prognosis um so there's an interesting side note here about the so this was just another example of a chart where things played out as predicted and looking at this chart when when the client came, I was able to tell her that probably things wouldn't improve for a while uh, just because the moon is void. And um, there were some indications of problems with medicine, which I'll go on to in a, in a, in a second. But then eventually, uh, and I, I gave her some timing for this, there would be an improvement perhaps through her daughter or perhaps through a really good nurse who might uh, introduce her to some treatment which would help for a while, but that help would not be permanent. Um, and the, the basis of that is the moon is void, not going anywhere for a while. When the moon changed sign, it trined Venus in the ninth, and Venus rules the fifth house, which could be a daughter or a child or something. Um, but Venus in the ninth could also be a nurse, a knowledgeable medical person, probably female, because Venus um, in, in, in a water sign, so it's a feminine planet in a, in a feminine sign. So that might be a, a sort of, and also Venus is conjunct Neptune in this chart. So I even thought, is this an anesthes, an anesthesiologist or some person knowledgeable about drugs or something like that? Um, and then Venus went to square Jupiter on the cusp of the 12th with reception. That usually shows improvement because Jupiter in a day chart, particularly, but Jupiter's here in Gemini, so in detriment, and on the cusp of the 12th house, which is a cadent house, it's a bit weaker, so the benefits may not last. The 12th house is also the house of hospitals, uh, I would say, in medical charts. So, so I thought that this chain of events suggested those kind of things. And, and um, she actually came, like the, the treatment I gave her didn't work very well at all at the time. I mean, just looking at the chart, We've got the sixth house has Sagittarius on the cusp and the 10th house has Pisces on the cusp. So immediately that ties together the sixth and the 10th, which I never like to see because it suggests that the medicines may produce side effects. It often suggests medicines may contribute to symptoms in a way, which which is okay if you're looking at the chart of something that you might expect to produce side effects like chemotherapy, for example, but, but not hopefully when you're prescribing milder medicines and also there was there was mars in the 10th house um and and mercury in pisces retrograde in the 10th so so there were a couple of indications that there might be problems with medicine but with eventual help and what she relayed to me and i think she said in the end that she found it really spooky that was her word <laughs> because i what 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 ended up happening is a few months later it was her daughter 
told her about this nurse she'd found and she went to see this nurse and this nurse referred her to a hospital specialist who gave her this treatment that improved her sinuses. And then a couple of years later, we she communicated with me by email that some of the issues had come back. Um, but she, I think the biggest value to her from this was just experiencing the astrology working was, was, was the most useful thing. I wasn't in this instance able to get much from the chart that enabled me to turn things around constructively or positively. So it was, it was frustrating on one level as a herbalist, but quite sort of um, uplifting on another level as an astrologer. So, Right. Yeah. So part of what this chart brings up is an old framework. And let me know if I have this right, where the first house represents the client, the seventh house represents the astrologer, the 10th house represents the treatment and the fourth house indicates the outcome. Is that yes. right? Yes, that's that's absolutely right, Chris. And, and as in medical charts, just generally, the 10th house, as you say, represents the medicine So uh, and six disease. So you just, you look at, um, you look at the movement of the first house, first ruler, which is in, and the moon, but in this case, it's the same planet because we've got cancer rising to see what will happen. Where does that go? Sort of like a little relay race of planets to see where it ends up. Um, yeah. Right. So this is why in some instances, for example, like in the considerations before judgment, Lily tells people to be like a little bit careful if there's something wrong with the seventh house or the ruler of the seventh house, because that's representing you, the astrologer, if there's a client who's, who's approached you. Yes. Or faulty judgment, or in this case, as, as the practitioner, um, so, you know, seventh house, not great in this chart. We've got Saturn uh, retrograde in Scorpio ruling the seventh. I mean, there's some, uh, it's like trining the ascendant. Okay. Um, and it's, it's with the North node, but it's, uh, I would not, I would not choose that <laughs> as the ruler of the seventh. Um, I mean, it, what, what's an interesting consideration is that in consultation charts, the seventh house does represent in this case, because it was a client coming to see me, it represented me as the astrologer and in this case as the herbalist. It also often speaks about the other seventh house things, like it can say something about the client's partner or it can say something about the client's other doctors. Because I've seen charts where I've thought, oh God, the seventh house rule is really messed up. I hope I'm not going to do a bad job for this client. But then it turns out the client's having a really hard time with their partner or it turns out that that this other doctor they're currently in a, in a lawsuit with or something, you know. So right. it, again, the context is is really important here. I don't think I did a great job. So unfortunately, I think that retrograde Saturn probably was me, particularly as it's sitting exactly on my score on my ascendant, which is eleven degrees Scorpio. So it's almost certainly me, unfortunately. Right. But um, yeah, you but know, that's like a good point. That sometimes, yeah. if if the question or the focus or they're tied up in other seventh house matters that sometimes it can be relating to that rather than you necessarily as the astrologer. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I mean, it's, so it's just comes back to that sort of context thing. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so this, this chart just showed the, the unfolding of events in, in, a, in a, as predicted really same as the previous, but with this one that the client was in get, was aware of the astrology uh, and, and was sort of, um, really, I think, helped by it, not materially, but in terms of, um, I think it just gave her a bit of a new perspective on things. <laughs> she, mm -hmm. she enjoyed it. She wrote back to me and said how stunned she was by it, um, which was great. And then I just wanted to show a couple of um, crisis charts based on that, which is an old, um, uh, uh, an old sort of timing technique, which you use to sort of, so you can always get the timing in a consultation chart from the from the original chart, from the radical chart, um, just by, you know, how many degrees is there between this planet and the next one? And how many degrees is there between that planet and the next one? So that's symbolic. The degrees equals weeks or months or, or years in some cases, mm. but then you would, you could take a, you could zoom in on different chunks of that time by using crisis charts. So, so they are basically calculated in the same way that, solar or lunar return charts are so um you would for a fast developing illness you'd use the moon and you'd do a chart for when the moon was um you know 
90 degrees away and then 180 degrees away and then 275 degrees away and then back where it started and and divisions in between there if you wanted more more charts like a the, the condition was much more moving much more swiftly for chronic or long-standing conditions you just use the sun so you do uh uh, you cast another chart, another crisis chart, typically for when the sun was 90 degrees away from its original position, then when it was in opposition to its original position, and then uh, sort of 275 degrees, and then back where it was at its original position. Does that does that make sense? So you create charts for each of those times. Um, same principle as a solar return chart, but they're like a, a solar quarter return and a solar half return chart uh, for for... for a consultation chart or a decumbiture. Um, and what I find interesting about this technique is it is actually generalizable to other charts in astrology. It's used for medical astrology. It's sort of fallen into that niche, but you can use this technique to sort of get a little zoom in on different quadrants of your year. If you've done a solar return chart, you could do a another chart in three months time for when the sun was 90 degrees away from your, your, your birth sun to sort of have a little zoom in on that quadrant of the year and so on. Anyway. Okay. And you have so an example of a solar crisis chart. And is that related to the previous This was one related to slide? this, this client. Yes. Yeah, so I won't spend long on these charts, but so this one and the next one, one is a bi-wheel, which just puts this one on top of the original consultation chart. So just looking at this chart, on, on its own, I think, um, thanks, Chris, um, that we've got it. I, I think it was, it was somewhat, I thought there might be some improvement. We've got 22 degrees Sagittarius rising and 26 Libra on the midheaven. Um, and in this chart, the moon, which was the ascendant ruler from the original chart, um, is in the 12th but it's separating from a trine of Jupiter and applying to a trine of Venus. So that I, I would say that's sort of contained by the rays of Venus and Jupiter. So that's maybe somewhat, some, somewhat helped at this point in time. Um, and that was, that was, a, I think, I can't remember whether that was six months, I think, from the initial consultation or perhaps even a bit longer. No, it's, it's more than that. It's, um, uh, six, six plus four, <laughs> 10 months, <laughs> 10 months, something like that. It's, mm. it's a, it's, a, it's a year and a, um, yeah, I think it's about 10 months from the initial consultation. You could see there was some improvement at that time. And then if, if we look at the by wheel, it's my, I hope this is, isn't a bit, this isn't bad for the people listening only on audio, but I'll try and be clear about the principles here. Um, all we're doing is putting the the crisis chart around this solar crisis chart around the initial consultation chart so in a by wheel and the key point here is how do the angles of that crisis chart relate to the angles of the initial consultation chart um and uh i think the ascendant of this crisis chart was in the sixth house of the initial consultation chart which i don't like very much um and the moon was also in the sixth house of the initial consultation chart. And I think the MC at 26 Libra was sort of um, in whole sign square to the, in, the initial rising sign of cancer. So it's like, yes, there's some improvement, but this person is still ill at this time. That's how I'd in interpret that, but maybe stabilizing a bit because the moon is being trined by Jupiter and Venus. Okay. Does that make sense? So it's just a really basic... Yeah, and chart. then so there's another one after that. This this is just the the final crisis chart, which I I I thought showed this this corresponded roughly with the prediction for eventual temporary improvement, and uh, this crisis chart was I think for maybe two years from on from the initial consultation, uh, with the sun back at ten Pisces where it was at the initial consultation. Uh, it's a chart with 16 Scorpio rising and four Virgo MC. Uh, and the ascendant ruler of this chart is Mars in, in Aries. And it's that Mars is applying to a trine of Jupiter in, in Leo, uh, but Jupiter is retrograde. So 
that that was interesting. But then when you do the by wheel uh, using this chart as a transit chart to the initial consultation chart, um, it's really interesting because the moon is in Cancer in the rising sign. So it's like the ascendant ruler of the initial consultation chart is really strong in its own sign. The ascendant of the consultation chart is trining the ascendant of the um the ascendant of the crisis chart beg pardon is trining the ascendant of the consultation chart and the mc of the consultation chart is in sextile to the ascendant of the uh, the ascent the mc of the crisis chart is in sextile to the ascendant of the consultation chart um it's not all good because the ascendant of the crisis is on saturn and as well as the north node so it's kind of this chart to me suggested the most positive sort of indications so far um, in terms of, and, and also very significantly by the, by this time that the, the North node was transiting over the consultation charts moon. So there were two indications of that initial ascendant ruler, the moon being really helped by this crisis. Uh, the fact that the moon was in her own sign of cancer in the ascendant and that the North node was transiting over the, the initial consultation charts moon in Libra, um, and as well as the other bits of the angles being friendly to the natal ascendant, but uh, the ascendant of the crisis picking up that Saturn. So this was just, this was just, an, I'm not going to go into any more crisis charts, Chris, I just, because it, obviously these are a bit complicated, but I just wanted to show how those were used traditionally and still can be used to sort of zoom in on on, on the timing of of of, of um, improvements but you can get the basic information always from the initial chart all right so i know you've, you've got another example chart um next let me put that up on the screen here okay okay so what was this uh chart of right so the I wanted to show this one because this was a, a really positive example of, of how I think astrology um, really helped someone in a very difficult situation um, and possibly of how I can't say for sure, because we can't like sliding doors it, you know, like that old film from the nineties sliding doors where you have different possibilities playing out. You can't split screen reality in that way, but I think the, the astrology the sort of, timing here really improved the prognosis. But anyway, so this is a horary chart for a, a client who, who was at one time my manager at work, a, a sort of clinic manager, and, and also is a friend um, who was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer that had sort of metastasized and spread to their liver. Um, and, and the prognosis was really not good. Um, so I'd done horaries for them before. And, and they asked me to do a horary on the situation, uh, which obviously wasn't great. So there, there are a few things. It's, it's a chart with 25 degrees Cancer rising. Uh, the midheaven is 28 degrees Pisces. And the moon, the ruler of the ascendant, is at one degree of Aquarius in the seventh quadrant house. Of course, it's the eighth whole sign of the seventh quadrant house. Mm -hmm. Um, so what was the question was the question, so the, the question, I, I wonder, I, I have it written down here. I can't remember, but I think it was something along the lines of what will happen, <laughs> but, but I can't, I can't actually remember what the specific I mean, question was. I thought was I, it I specifically about mortality and like, will I die or was it? I think it actually, I'm telling a lie, Chris, I think this was actually a consultation chart. I thought it was a horary, but looking at the initial original chart here, I've written it down as a horary. It was actually a consultation chart um, because I, I did it as a, I, when they were telling me about it, I wrote everything down as sort of like took notes, like a consultation, but I didn't end up doing herbal treatment because they were being treated by an, a fellow practitioner, another practitioner at the clinic. So they ended up just coming to me for the astrology. Um, so, yeah, so actually uh, that's a mistake. I've, I've said it's a horary and it's not, it's a consultation chart. Effectively, they're interpreted the same way. So it doesn't make a huge deal of difference, practically speaking, but sure. Yeah, so apologies. I was just curious in terms of, um, yeah, that is interesting. Here's the recalculated chart. There it is. It just did the difference between being in the seventh by quadrant and the eighth by sign. And yes. I was just curious if the, the specter of like their own mortality was part of the 
the yes, focus yeah, or, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure for sure, like that the fact that their 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 planet is in the eighth um, whole sign is 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 significant. I mean, there are a few little extra details that I didn't even see at the time that now I would immediately notice. Like, for example, the mid heaven being at that late degree of Pisces, it's right next to Shiat. You know, the the, the fixed star Shiat, which I always say is what it sounds like. It's not a great star. Um, yeah. Do you know so, what the so that, combination? I can't remember the. Um, I know it's. I, I th- I, it's either it might be just be Mars or it's Mars Saturn. I can't. I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head. But it's 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 a really it's a it's a star that often indicates sort of poison, drowning. It's it's a bit grim. So mm. so having that on the mid heaven, which is the bit of medicine, in, indicates difficulties. And, and also the the we again in this chart we've got Pisces on the MC and sagittarius on the cusp of the six so we've got the same planet ruling the medicine and the illness in this context though because this was a patient with a a serious cancer diagnosis who was going to be going for chemotherapy i thought it was absolutely apt you because you don't get chemotherapy without serious side effects so the mm. fact that medicines and sickness are linked makes absolute sense in terms of chemo so mm. just in terms of the general chart interpretation we've got the moon in, in in aquarius it applies to sextile saturn and that in this case is is a moderately good thing because uh there's a, it's it's received saturn receives the moon but then saturn is retrograde so I, I saw that as being there would be an improvement, but then there may be some relapse. Um, and I think I, I, I'd sort of the timing, if I, I've written it down here, the moon moves three or four degrees in a fixed sign and in an angle, which indicates three or four slow units. So that could be three or four months or years to achieve a kind of remission because, of, because Saturn receives the moon. Um, but then, um, the moon and, and I've made a little note here on the screen that Ibn Ezra, one of the sort of medieval astrologers, I think his book was translated by Mira Epstein, uh, defines application to a retrograde planet as returning of light. So Masha Allah's on reception technique just says, go to the final dispositor, which in this case, the moon goes to Saturn. And then if it's retrograde, whatever the planet represents will sort of come undone or go backwards. But I wanted to go past that and get more timing. So, okay, there'll be a recovery and then possibly some kind of relapse. So what happens after that? So Ibn Ezra said, that's a returning of light. Saturn will return the light to the moon because Saturn's retrograde. So then I I went on and moved the moon to the next aspect, which was an opposition to Jupiter, the rule of the six, which was also retrograde and the rule of the 10th which I, I, I thought would be return of disease. And the moon moved another 12 units in a fixed sign and in, a, in, a, in, a, in the seventh house, which I thought would be another 12 months or years. And I'm, I'm hedging my bets here because I don't know, initially, I, I can't tell whether those long units of time are going to be months or years. And this is the point I'm getting to, that you shoot for the longer unit of time. You know, so if this is if the, if you can regard this as a potentially elasticated window, you could go. Okay, so there'll be recurrent. There'll there'll be some improvement, and then at some point there may be a relapse and a return to the disease. But if you could think that that could be twelve units of time, could be twelve months or twelve years. Now, obviously, you could go in with crisis charts, and you can look at the birth chart and transits of the birth chart, and take a and take a. A, a more than educated guess at when that relapse might be um because you know if the if the transits or the progressions or the 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 whatever are are looking much worse in 12 years then it's more likely that, that relapse will be in 12 years if they're looking a lot worse in a year's time then it might be the relapse is in, is in 12 months if you're being really stoically predictive about it but my aim would be to say to share that information with the client. And in this case, this, this client, as I say, was somebody who knew me quite well, had been a manager. Um, she's also a fellow Aries with a Capricorn moon, as I am. So I, I don't mind being really direct with her because <laughs> mm-hmm. we're really, really direct with each other, like blunt as anything. And 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 they actually appreciate that, whereas the other clients might might be sort of a bit... Um, 
uh, wobbly if you discussed potential relapse with them when they had such a serious diagnosis. But uh, I was able to say, look, this could be, it, it suggests there may be some relapse. So don't panic if after some initial improvement, there's a bit of return. And we're going to try and shoot for that to maximize that window up to 12 years and even beyond because I don't believe this timing is, is, is fixed. Um, so, uh, let me just, could I have a look at the chart again, Chris? Is that, is that okay? Oh, sure. just, yeah. Thank you. So that was one of the, one of the issues though, with timing with, with Hori and things is just sometimes, um, looking at the number of degrees between significators and looking at the modality or quadruplicity of the signs involved cardinal fixed mutable and then mm. trying to convert that to days or months or years but there being some ambiguity always in that in that timing technique about which for sure it's going to end up being absolutely i mean you can you can tighten that up and make as i say a, a pretty good guesstimation by looking at say if you have the client's birth chart, you can look at the transits to the birth chart, or you could look at the solar returns for particular years or directions, if they're having any heavy primary directions or whatever. And even within the horary, without looking at the natal chart, you can sometimes look at transits to the horary and that there are other timing techniques you can use in horary that can help to tighten things up. But it's still, I tend to, particularly with issues like this, I tend to say it could be that, or it could be that, in this situation, let's aim for the longer timing. <laughs> let's aim to make it indefinite, because what this chart doesn't show is that uh, is is it's all doom and gloom. There is that initial reception by Saturn, um, which is, and there were other some some other hopeful elements, like for example that very dignified Mars in the tenth house, um, showing some help from from surgery or from aggressive treatment. Um, I say it's help because Mars is very dignified. There's some problems with it because it's Mars in a day chart. So that's the out of sec malefic could be a bit over aggressive, a bit over inflammatory and Mars is squaring the ascendant. So that sort of cancer ascendant getting beat up by Mars a bit there, but it's still a strong dignified planet in the 10th. So it's like surgery or, 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 or aggressive treatment can, can actually do some good, but what will also, as you might expect, cause some inflammation. Um, so I think in, in the end, I mean, I, I, I think I've got I wrote down what, what I actually emailed slide here. Oh, th thank you, Chris. Okay. <laughs> yes. Great. Uh, I've, I've typed it all on the slide in really tiny writing. Um, so I've got sort of on the timing I, at the time, this, this, cause this was, this was a conversation that we had in, in, in March, 2015, I predicted that it would be remission from July 2015, if if the shorter units of time, or October 2018-ish, I think, possible relapse from February, March 2016, if we're using the shorter units of time, or in 12 years time, which would make it um, 2027. I only use basic techniques in the hurry, so these timings aren't tight. Bear in mind, this is an email that I sent to the client uh, who, Bear in mind that astrology illustrates the current direction of events, not the inevitable. Your actions can modify the outcomes and fully alter the timeframes involved, if not the nature of the events, i.e. a difficult period will still be difficult, but you have control over how it manifests. And then I just put something about how surgery might be more profitable than drugs because of that strong Mars in the 10th, but the, the watery um, Shiat on the uh, the watery Pisces on midheaven with with Shiat there sort of I was like mm, I'm not not so keen on 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 sort of particularly liquid medicines but I, I quite like maybe surgery although it will cause some inflammation and some harm it will improve the prognosis drugs will help but will make you sick and have diminishing returns and that's just because the tenth and the six having the same rulership by by that retrograde Jupiter um, yeah which is quite usual for chemo. So, so the, the fascinating thing here was that was that the patient said that in July uh, they had a major operation in July 2015, which was very successful, and the doctor said they'd test every six months for the next three years until October November 2018, after which I could be considered to be in remission, which was kind of hilarious. And the patient said they had a gut feeling that they would live another 12 years because that was the age that their mum died, which was fascinating. Um, but then in 
July 2016, the nodules were seen again in the lungs on the scan. So that was a shorter time frame showing some potential retur return of disease. But um, I'm happy to say this, this um, client and, and also a friend of mine is, is still in good health with regular monitoring. So they're kind of like living with in good health uh, rather than di dying from. So despite events following the predicted shorter time frame, the longer time frame is the narrative being aimed for and past that uh, ideally. So we're sort of because we're able to discuss this chart, this client was fully interested in the astrology. And we discussed sort of the, the idea of non inevitability and the sort of fractal timing, the idea that you can you can maximize the windows of these things and optimize outcomes uh, so that the medical chart was used to sort of um, maximize possibilities. Um, and, and as I've mentioned, this this kind of discussion is is not always appropriate with all all patients or all clients because some clients might feel cursed by being given any time frame at all, particularly with a client with when you say, "Oh, this might relapse." But in this case, this particular person emailed me and said uh, they credited the astrology with saving their life because. He said that the herbs that they got from the other practitioner, who was uh, one of my clinical trainers at the time, and the astrology they got from me, they said between between those two, you saved my life, and this is some because it's something that helped her reframe everything, and and uh, sort of really get through it. Um, so it was it was a net positive, but it it still it it is always tricky what to what to share and how to frame it. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was that. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, um, you know, astrologers are just doing these things for themselves sometimes in order to get peace of mind or some perspective on things. And sometimes that in and of itself can be helpful in can. Although, knowing although, the uh, pros and cons. Yeah, definitely. Although I've, I had a really interesting discussion with Sharon Knight, who, who's an amazing astrologer, amazing traditional astrologer. And, and we, we talked about how um, sometimes you know, when you're really ill, you don't, you, you're looking at the astrology can also be a bit scary if you're a traditional astrologer, because, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, there are certain things you don't want to see. So I think it's, that for me is just another really pragmatic reason to adopt a neoplatonic mindset. Because if you, it's all very well saying I'm a philosophical stoic, but when your back's against the wall, and if you've just had a really horrible diagnosis and you're actually a stoic and you believe that your fate is fixed, and then you look at a horrible chart, I mean, I suppose it's a real test of your faith if you if you um, have an ability under those circumstances to be what Valens called a soldier of faith, um, then 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 great. But I think I think it might be more constructive to to take the sort of Neoplatonic view and go, okay, we know this astrological fate is going to play out somehow, but how can I how can I manifest that more positively in the most positive way? Does that does that Makes sense. I mean, that's that's only yeah. how I see. I mean, it, but. I think how no matter how what the astrology says, that the mm. person should always try to do the best that they can to, um, you know, fight through things that are difficult and hope for the Definitely. best and, and shoot for the best and most optimistic yes. scenario. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. You always shoot for the best. You want to maximize maximize the highest sort of possibility. And and uh, Sharon and I talked about in because Sharon had been through a very difficult diagnosis at one time. And I can talk about this because we, we did a little video on my, my tiny little YouTube channel about it. So she'd been very open about this and, and Sharon's written articles about it. Uh, uh, when, when she had a, a very difficult diagnosis a few years back, um, she did some astrology, but she did very, very basic minimal astrology because she, what she didn't want to do is go in with a horary or with a really specific laser focused detailed astrology and, and really feel like she was narrowing her options. Do you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I thought that was really smart. Actually, she did some really basic astrology. She looked at one planet in, in, in her, like in, di in a di direction at the time. So, okay, when Mars changes sign, I've got to be better by then. Um, which I thought as an astrologer is really smart because it's, it's a lot easier to be objective with other people than it is to be with yourself. Do you know what I mean? Cause you can sort of be a bit more ruthless and then make the decision to be constructive with them. But if it's yourself, you might freak out. 
So I don't know. It's 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 an interesting one for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think different um, astrologers have different um, tolerance levels and diff- not tolerance levels, but um, what feels appropriate to one astrologer might not feel appropriate to others. And there's Definitely. such a huge range of things that um, that's one of the things that becomes hard when some of these things are discussed um, publicly because that comes up in all sorts of different areas of what feels like appropriate to talk about or when there's like an event in the news or there's a celebrity death or something um, and what feels helpful or healing or part of processing, let's say something, some astrologers processing, let's say a death in their own life mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. what feels um, not some, something that feels uh, cheap or, or tacky yeah, or, it's, it's- um, you know, inappropriate. It, it's, there's such a wide range that it's really hard to sometimes establish community standards for different things because of that, that wide range. Sure, sure. I think I think the po- the point here is more about in 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 a really tricky medical situation. I think astrology has enormous value in terms of its ability to predict and navigate through that. But that when you have a really tricky medical situation, <laughs> there's there's always that there's always if you if you get a prediction that looks really negative, it's a lot easier to be um objective and helpful if it's not you in that situation so you know just just it's just something that each astrologer has to say because i know that if i because i know when i when i've got sick i mean i've nearly died twice i mean once as a child and once as an adult and 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 now but not since i've learned astrology <laughs> so nowadays if 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 or when i get i get sick i would i would almost certainly look at it because I, 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 in detail, but I think that may not necessarily always be the right thing to do. It might be better for an astrologer to look at, to look at things with a wider focus in order to leave their sort of, their sense of possibility more open to soft focus it a little bit. Some things, some things are better looked at from the corner of your eye, I think sometimes, Mm. but it, do you know what I mean? It just yeah. It's I, mean, an interesting I go back one because <laughs> I go back and forth because I think sometimes that's true, and I think astro- astrologers, sometimes especially traditional astrologers, because we've seen so many charts and we've seen the worst case scenarios play yeah. out. Sometimes our mind can tend to, when we see something coming up in our own chart that looks difficult, our mind can tend to drift towards thinking or assuming or or worrying that it will be the worst case scenario when that Mm. transit hits or that time load period starts or whatever it is. And then you get there and sometimes it's difficult and challenging or it's something bad, but it's not quite as bad as you. It's it's, it's never exactly the same as what you thought. Exactly. I think it's just the, the Saturn rulership of traditional, of traditional astrology and traditional astrologers. I've not met many traditional astrologers who don't have, some kind of prominent Saturn in their chart. So, so I think, sure. I think it's so, probably a little bit of that going on. So that's definitely an issue. And it's definitely something to be conscious <clears throat> of uh, sure. because it can, you can worry or put yourself in a situation where it's not as helpful or you can freak yourself out about the worst case scenarios that can be counterproductive. But then there's also, um, you know, something that is helpful as a processing tool or as a coping mechanism. I think sometimes when astrologers do want to look at charts, when difficult things, including illness are happening in their lives. And I know when I got sick a couple of years ago with COVID and it turned into a longer thing, just being aware Mm of, of that, um, what the transits were and, uh, some of it was just kind of interesting intellectually. And I was purely looking at it from that standpoint of knowing exactly what was going on in my life and, what the manifestation was in the astrology and in in my um, physical body at that time, and getting some sense of the the time frames involved, and and mm. that I have Aquarius rising, and Saturn had just moved into my first house, and different things like that um, were both a little bit intellectually helpful for me, but also a little bit personally reassuring to some extent yeah. um, in getting some sense of the timing involved and what was going on. So I think it just varies really wildly. So that's one of the reasons I bring it up is just because I know it's yeah no that's from- fantastic. I mean it's, that's a wonderful example, Chris. Actually, just because did you find that sort of 
the timing sort of gave you a light at the end of the tunnel in a way because you could you could sort of see where things might be improving from you know sort of the point where things might improve from yeah a little bit because some of it was short term like mars transits that were showing the short term most intense phases of you know transiting when i first got sick i was in a 12th house perfection year and transiting mars okay conjoined my natal Mars in the 12th house in a day chart, which is the most difficult planet for me. So it made perfect sense that that event ended up being getting sick and then having what became a really acute, um, uh, well, intense like month or two of being super. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then that sort of didn't help when Mars and Saturn then both conjoined each other in Aquarius the following month and it actually got worse um mm. but then eventually knowing that mars would get out of that right out of aquarius after a couple of months and then yeah there was yeah. like starting to come back into um not being in super emergency room type situation yeah. anymore um but I then think, it's, I th yeah 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 no because I, I just i want to say that what you brought up what you've described is uh, i think one of them because i haven't really mentioned this <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah one of the major values of the of the of, of astrology and medical situations is just the timing is right. knowing when is this crap going to be over with you know having a sense of that there's a light at the end of the tunnel because when you're ill you can't really imagine being well in the same way that when you're well you can't really imagine being ill I, obviously i don't mean that literally we can all imagine it but you know when you're actually in it Mm -hmm. you know you, you you very we very quickly lose perspectives the wall the walls close in very rapidly on any you know it's like humans we have a really short short-term memory for emotions in a way do you know what i mean it's like it's like any miracle quickly becomes mundane mm -hmm. uh so when you when you're sick you, so it's just really helpful having that kind of okay so this all kicked in when that that began so just going by the logic of following that process just following the astrology then it's likely to be ending or at least getting better by this point. Just having that in your mind is such a powerful thing. Uh, it, it, that has remedial value in and of itself, I think. Um, right. And that's aside from, you know, using astrology to generate ideas for therapies or potentially to select uh, different um, people who might help you, you know, I've got clients who help use astrology to help them find the right doctor or fight, you know, whatever. So, so there's other practical, but just that on its own is, is huge, I think. Yeah. And it can give some of that short-term benefit when you're talking about things that are short-term or also mm -hmm. being somewhat realistic about the long-term because early on during that first month, um, I didn't have any immediate reason to think that i would be sick for more than like a week or two but then also mm -hmm. realizing the mars transit would be going on for you know a couple of months at least through my rising sign and then noticing that saturn had just moved into a you know three-year-long transit through my first house and knowing what that had been like for other clients and that that can coincide with long-term right sort of health issues and not having any in those early days of the pandemic you know everyone thought People yeah. were either getting sick and recovering or they were dying from it and there wasn't anything else. But then that seeing that astrology and then it turning into a much longer term health issue through um, long haul COVID things that I've been dealing with over the past couple of years, which, you know, also gives me some perspective on it, but also hopefully at least some timing thing in terms of Saturn finally getting out of Aquarius next year and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. i mean it's it, it, it's 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 fascinating and i think in the, in a sense just having that you were prepped in the, in in a good way i i would think and hope by by you know just you, you're given some advance warning because you know you saw that you saw the mars oh actually mars is going to linger a bit in the ascendant and saturn's just gone in there so maybe this won't be such a quick process so you might take have taken that in a really negative way and gone oh no i'm i'm going to be dealing but it's also you're kind of forewarned is forearmed right it's like okay don't i'm not going to freak out if this takes longer than i initially thought it would for me to get over okay. um i think i think that's a really a really positive sort of potential to take to take from that um but 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 this stuff is so context dependent um it's so context dependent you know what i mean by that so right. so so you know really depends what what's 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 going on in, in in the world and and uh and also with your with your own health 
uh, as to as to how, how much. So if if it's a self limiting condition and you're in reasonably good health and you can see that this is something that can that could then it's it's a lot less scary. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. With something like at the time that was really bit bit scary because covid and we it was 2020 so what the hell nobody really knew what the long term ramifications were right but at the same time you could use the astrology to say okay this might be going on longer than i'd like but i can see that there's an end to this process so yeah yeah, yeah. and i think it just gives people some perspective and some maybe patience with the process sometimes which can be helpful yeah um all right so you've got one more example chart i think right yes i think so just the right. last one, so which is one. another more positive one. Yeah, I wanted to end. I sort of started on kind of a a, a bit of a, a down down downbeat grim one, and I sort of wanted to uh, yeah. end on a more positive one. Um, I, I start I start all of my podcast episodes with child mortality <laughs> uh, topics. <laughs> oh uh, my a, god! Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Sc- Scorpio rising, Saturn in my tenth sign. What, what can I say? I mean, it's just you know, right. it's kind of kind of good par for the course, eh? But um, all right. Yeah, so you're... um. Yeah, so th- this this was a consultation chart uh, for, uh, and I- I'll just briefly describe the chart. We've got fifteen Virgo rising. There's a ten degree Gemini midheaven with Jupiter in the tenth at thirteen degrees, so conjunct the midheaven, and Pisces. Uh, sorry, Mercury, the ascendant ruler, is at twenty six degrees Pisces in the seventh house. Um, the other salient bit of this chart, I would say, is the moon is at six degrees Taurus in the ninth house, applying to oppose Saturn retrograde uh, in Scorpio, nine degrees Scorpio. So, what? What? I think there's there might be one more chart. After this was this that? No, this is the last one, isn't it? So, so yeah, I, I wanted to just make the point with this chart that sort of dignity. Is this a consultation everything. chart or, or, or it's, a chart? Oh, beg pardon? Yeah, this was a consultation chart, Chris. Yes, thank you. So yeah. this this was the chart of a consultation. So this was a client who came to see me um, a few years ago who had a sort of chronic urticaria, which is like this crazy whole body itching. Um, and the story was really interesting. They 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 lived abroad. And they were bitten by uh, an ant and they had a minor sort of reaction to the ant bite. And then this just their whole body just flared up and it just wouldn't stop. And they'd had steroids and antihistamines and all sorts and it just wasn't stopping. So um, what the point I wanted to make this chart, uh, I, you can do the, the sort of you can do the prognosis and the timing. So I looked at Mercury, the ascendant ruler, and that was changing sign into Aries. And then it was applying by sextile to Jupiter in the mid heaven. So that was, oh, there's going to be some relief from medicine. Um, but the moon, the secondary significator, and I would I would use Mercury here as the primary significator because Mercury, the ascendant ruler, did behold the ascendant. It was in a sign which could, from using traditional aspects, can see the ascendant. It's in Pisces, which is the seventh sign. So it's not in the eighth sign or the sixth sign or the second or the twelfth sign, it can see the ascendant. So I use Mercury as the primary significator of, of the timing and Mercury was moving moving out of Pisces into, into Aries and then going on to sextile Jupiter. So that was a good outcome. But the moon was applying to that opposition of Saturn. So I was like, well, okay, there'll be some initial worsening or problems followed by alleviation, just looking at the basic sort of prognosis of it. But, but what was interesting about this chart to me was that Mercury is in its detriment and fall in the seventh house, and Jupiter, the ruler of the seventh, is in its detriment. Um, but they have um, what's called a generosity in, in traditional astrology, which is which is to say they have what's sometimes called a mutual reception, although I'm going to be pedantic here, technically it isn't, because a mutual a reception is is only a reception when there's an applying aspect <laughs> so so the the, the the and i got this from barbara dunn's amazing book on on horary astrology where she really defines all those terms used in horary mm-hmm. uh, and uh she sort of said generosity is the term when a planet is in another planet's major when two planets are in each other's major dignities but they're not they're not actually an aspect to each other they're not in an applying aspect so, so um, in this case, you'd say Mercury and Jupiter were in generosity with each other. But, but the way I interpreted that is that 
the practitioner and the patient and the, the patient and the medicine will be beneficial to each other, but there's going to be some confusion and changes of course, and some sort of, um, some, some, it's going to, it's going to take a bit of working out because both of those planets are in their detriment and, and, Mer and Mercury's its detriment at fall. But there's, there's, uh, the, the issue here is that it's the dignity of those planets being weak, both those planets being in their detriment is going to indicate some problems, but the fact that they're in a generosity with each other and that Jupiter is the final dispositor is, is going to resolve things. Um, so, uh, and, and, and this followed the prognosis exactly, basically. So uh, the, the outcomes were that all the symptoms gradually resolved with the treatment, which was a sort of herbal tea, which was very effective. But just after the first follow-up, a month later, the client emailed me. I remember the moon was going to oppose that Saturn, and Saturn was the sixth ruler in this chart. But obviously the moon opposing Saturn retrograde in Scorpio in the third was, is not great in any chart um <laughs> the client emailed me and said the week after i spoke to you i had a bit of a crash no energy itching like crazy ended up taking antihistamines every day even with the tea it wasn't settling majorly depressed still couldn't sleep ended up in tears one day at work and got sent home my manager has been really supportive and that was the the moon applying to the opposed saturn but the manager being really supportive was fascinating because we have that jupiter in the 10th um and it also fit with another timing element, which was Mercury in Pisces moving on to the fixed star Shiat at the end of Pisces. So just, a, you know, Mercury moved a couple of degrees and then it was on Shiat. So that there were sort of two, you could see there was upcoming issues. And then gradually after that, I think things just improved. Uh, so we kept sort of adapting the T formula, like the T formula was sort of shifted about a couple of times. Um, and then, and then uh, it just improved from there. So basically, the, the predicted events happened, um, but the correct treatment was sort of uh, the treatment was based on 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 the chart. So I used lots of herbs of mercury. I think I used herbs of Saturn because the skin was involved, um, and it, it, using the, the sort of chart helped to maximize the the, the benefits. I think um, so. Yeah. I mean, just a side note on that, not using this chart, there was another chart and I, I did debate about whether to use this chart or another one, but I, I oh, oh, no, it's here. I, th I thought I did, I did stick it in there. There was one more chart, which is this one. This is another example of, um, of, a, of, a, of a consultation chart where you have, so the, the previous one that I talked about, you've got Mercury and Jupiter. Okay. Well, they're neutral to good planets. Here you've got in this consultation chart, you've got Mars and Saturn as significators, um, but they were still, I was still able to use them very constructively. So just to describe the chart, this is another consultation chart for a different client um, who had, I'd seen them a few years previously, and then they came back and, and what had happened was they'd they'd had a major health episode while i was away on sabbatical which they were really cross about <laughs> what were you what you were away when i needed you i'm sorry but they'd had a major health episode and they'd had to go to hospital and take a load of steroids and ever since they'd had these steroids and, and this 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 health episode they'd kept having panic attacks and these panic attacks that kept recurring so this chart has four degrees capricorn rising 10 degrees scorpio mc the ascendant ruler is Saturn at 16 degrees Scorpio in the quadrant 10th. It's the 11th whole sign, but the quadrant 10th house. And we've got Mars, the MC ruler at 25 degrees Libra. Um, the major point I wanted to make about this chart was, I mean, there's, I could go into the timing, which, you know, it, again, the timing worked from the chart, but but the, the major point I wanted to make here is that you've got Saturn retrograde in the 10th house of medicine and the 10th ruler is Mars in Libra, this sort of debilitated Mars. So using sort of Culpepper's cool rules for, 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 for myself as a herbalist for selecting treatment, he said, you use the ruler of the 10th to make your medicines if the ruler of the 10th is strong. Well, in this case, the rule of the 10th is Mars in a daytime chart in its detriment in Libra. It's in a horrible state. 
But the key thing here is that Mars and Saturn, the ascendant ruler, have a really strong generosity because Mars is in Libra, which is Saturn's exaltation, and Saturn is in Scorpio, which is ruled by Mars. So no matter how messed up either of them are, they kind of like each other and they'll help each other out. Um, I mean, there's, there's loads I could say about this chart, but basically it's interesting that it was the medical treatment, the very strong doses of steroids that this patient had been given that had kicked off these panic attacks, probably by two, two means, but flooding them with cortisol in very stressful circumstances. So you can see from the chart that the medicines, the stress induced by the medicines was a cause of problems, but it also gave me a clue as to how to treat it. I used herbs of Saturn and of Mars that were appropriate to the signification. The prescription worked so well. It worked amazingly. Um, it's sort of like the panic attacks just went away almost immediately. And they did get a few more episodes, but the, the prescription worked amazingly. And it was wholly based on, on plants that were traditionally ruled by Mars and Saturn. Um, and the, the prognosis from the chart was, was I, I used the sort of the moon went to the moon in Aries went to square the sun in cancer. So that's a square, but with a mutual reception because uh, Air, the moon in Aries is moon is in Aries, which is the exaltation of the sun. The sun in cancer is ruled by the moon. Um, but then the sun changed sign and immediately squared Mars, I think, um, or no, beg pardon, the sun squared Mars from Cancer. So this Mars is in Libra. So it went moon to square sun with mutual reception. So initial good things with a bit of effort. Then the sun squared Mars with mutual, what I call mutual rejection, because Mars is in Libra, which is the sun's fall, and the sun is in Cancer, which is Mars's fall. So that would be an increase in stress or some kind of increase in inflammation. And then Mars changed sign and went to square Jupiter, um, which would indicate a, a good outcome because Jupiter, although Jupiter ruled the 12th house, um, it was positioned in the seventh house. So I thought that would be a, a moderate to good outcome. So what happened was, was uh, pretty much followed that, that trajectory. But what was remarkable about this is that the prescription worked so well from the first dose, their symptoms just went. And I think, and, and, and it was just based on the, the sort of Mars Saturn symbolism um, which I find so in my point with this is that the astrology helped me in find the best treatment. And also that, that perhaps rather counterintuitively, that treatment was based around the two malefics and the rule of the 10th being really debilitated. So this, this goes back to the earlier point about context, particularly the sort of the internal context of the chart in this case, the fact that yes, Mars in Libra in a day chart is a is the planet and it will indicate some difficulties that, that this person's work involved educating groups of people and it was in the context of this teaching that they would get these panic attacks so that's mars in the in the whole sign 10th quadrant ninth house debilitated but it also gave me a clue as to how to how to treat the, treat the thing so it's sort of like when used knowledgeably uh, or with intention, difficult planets can have positive effects and, and, and in a really practical way. So. Right. And so you're combining the indications from the charts and sometimes the indication of the natal chart and also incorporating things like the temperament and the humors um, of the native or that are indicated in the charts themselves in order to find sometimes counterbalancing or soothing um, herbal remedies that can um, help to alleviate some of the indica indications or some of the what the person yes, is struggling I mean, with? Ju absolutely. Just to make a, a quick point, though, <laughs> uh, because it's like a Venn diagram. So, so I'm not just picking herbs out on the basis of the astrology alone. Right. I'm also, I mean, a, a four-year, five-year BSc in, in herbal medicine and, and whatnot. So I, I tend to um, make a biomedical diagnosis and come to sort of like some diagnostic sort of conclusions. And then I'll have a short list of potential remedies and then I'll do the astrology and it's whatever is in the overlap that I'll prescribe. So, so for, for skeptics of astrology, I, I, I think the worst thing that could be said is that I'm excluding some potential remedies on the basis of the astrology. What I'm not doing is generating remedies wholly and entirely from the astrology or wholly and entirely from sort of a biomedical standard 
approach <laughs> do you know what i mean it's like what's right. in, in the middle and obviously i'm using herbs because i'm hello herbalist so yeah. yeah so so like with most things it's not just sufficient to do just astrology or just be knowledgeable about the astrology but as with all crossover fields like financial astrology you also have to be good yeah. at doing finances and trading in order to be able to use the astrology um exactly. productively and if you come in just thinking you're, gonna, you're an astrologer and you can pick up financial trading the next day and be super successful you're going to be disappointed and in, in the same way you have a very strong background and that is your primary focus initially is the herbalism but you're just using the astrology to supplement that to give you a little bit of additional information to sometimes fine-tune things yes exactly exactly that chris thank you very well put yeah okay cool all right well that's a good i think that's a really good introduction to consultation charts to um medical astrology to some of the overlaps with herbalism to timing some timing techniques and horary and uh and consultation charts and medical astrology we've covered a surprising amount of ground today <laughs> and, and we opened up with like a large um philosophical discussion at the same time so um yeah so that was great Good, thank you, thank you. I hope it wasn't too, um, too, too sort of uh, all, all over the shop, but I've, I've enjoyed it, and uh, and I, I, I could have, spe- I, I really like those sort of philosophical tangents at the beginning. So I could have, could have gone down a few more rabbit holes there, but uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I really do appreciate that as well, and grounding everything in that philosophical and technical and historical context, and then getting into the the details of the charts themselves. Um, so, and it's a nice supplement to, you had mentioned earlier, some of the earlier episodes I did like episode 71 with Lee Lehman that was on medical astrology. That was kind of a broad, Mm. big picture sort of approach. And here we've kind of focused a little bit more specifically on looking at charts and the process of how some of that goes, at least when it comes to consultation charts. So this is really good and a nice additional step in terms of some of those previous discussions. So thank you. Yeah. So, um, where can people find out more about your work? You, your website is nocturnalherbalist.com, right? Yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my sort of, there's a little bit of info there. It's a really basic sort of booking site with, with a, a few bits and bobs there. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best place to sort of look, look for me. I mean, there's also, this is very off topic, but I've written my book about chocolate. There's a little bit of stuff in astro- about astrology in it, but it's yeah, like a little tiny. Bar. A tiny book about chocolate that I, I got <laughs> called The Secret Life of Chocolate, which is uh, surprisingly comprehensive. It's a 700-page uh, book, and it's really impressive and really interesting, actually. And in terms of synchronicity, weirdly, like showed up uh, randomly. You had sent it to me, but it took, you know, publishers, yeah, sometimes yeah. it comes quick, and sometimes it shows up like months later, and it just randomly showed up the same day that I was learning how to the hard way, how to melt chocolate, or <laughs> as I learned how, how not to melt chocolate, it turns out it's very delicate and takes some finessing in it's order really to do tricky. it properly. Yeah. 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 No, that's, a, I loved it. Like you said, you said that to me in email. I was like, that's amazing. I love it. There's yeah. little moments of universal synchronicity where, uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, the, the universe likes to, likes to mess with likes its little, little jokes. Bit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So you, you worked on this for over a decade though, and it's super interesting and com- comprehensive. How did it, was it through herbalism that you originally got into that or through some something else? Yeah, um, yes, really. I mean, I'm, I'm a massive chocoholic. So that, that, that was a factor. Sure. And, and, yeah, I kind of had the idea of of maybe writing it while I was I was at uni. I kind of wanted a a, a sort of tro- to Trojan horse in some ideas about um, traditional medicine and metaphysics in a book about chocolate. So so it's it's all about the ancient history of it, uh, so more so than the modern confection. I mean, there's a bit of detail about that how the confections made and some of its origins but the most of the book focuses on sort of the pre-columbian origins of of, of chocolate and and how cacao was used in 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 those societies and so on so and a lot about the pharmacology and the medicinal uses of it and stuff so i, I really got into it because I, I was studying herbs big chocolate head so it's sort of a natural a natural topic and also i thought well people like chocolate so if I call the book The Secret Life of Chocolate, maybe people will be incentivized to buy it. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, all of those yeah. things. Um, so it took you over a decade to write it. What are you working on next or what are some of your next projects coming up? Oh, well, I'm sort of, 
Uh, that's a very good question. At the, at the moment, I've, I've got, there's a few things coming up. So in terms of writing, I'm giving it another year before I even think about writing anything else. So I'm just like still in sort of a recovery phase after, after finishing that. But in terms of upcoming stuff, thank you, Chris. There's, there's um, the big thing I want to mention is that um, myself and two other astrologers are putting together a, a, um, a medical astrology course at Kepler. Um, so we've got um, an introduction to medical astrology. We ran this module, sort of pilot version of it, I think last year, and we're relaunching it in um, sort of, and hopefully it'll run regularly from September this year. So from fall, uh, from August, uh, sorry, September, October, fall or autumn this year. And that's myself and uh, Judith Hill and William Morris. Uh, and Will and myself are, are more sort of traditional. Judith is a bit more contemporary. There's a really good balance of, of, of astrologers doing that. So that's called um, Introduction to Medical Astrology or MD100. And, and you can find that, I, I hope, on the keplercollege.org uh, site. Uh, and I'll be doing a set of modules after that, MD101, uh, from winter sort of either late this year or early next year, which is going to be focusing on consultation charts. So that's, I really wanted to plug those because, because um, we're, that's, we're hoping to get the whole uh, medical astrology module, put like a whole course on medical astrology put together at Kepler over time. Um, and then just one event coming up, Chris, which is on, on the Saturday, the 23rd of April in the UK. Um, there's the Bolton Astrological Society's conference um i think that's uh yeah so, so i'm i'm just going to be speaking at that so uh, if anyone's interested in that then the best way to to um find out about it is to email them at bolton astrology at gmail.com um because they they're a really good little group and i'm going to be speaking there they uh, but i they they don't have a page for the for the event so <laughs> so just email them so yeah cool. Cool. Well, the, that's, that's the Bolton Astrological Society, so people can search for that. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and your website, once again, is nocturnalherbalist.com. Um, yes. So thanks, thanks a lot for joining me today. This was great. Well, thank you very much for having me, Chris. It's been a been a, been a real pleasure. So thank you. Yeah, we we met actually. I meant to say at the beginning at the um, Astrological Association conference in 2019 when I went out there to give a talk in June of 2019 and had been planning on doing something for a while. So I'm glad that it finally finally came together. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eventually, eventually happened. So great. Brilliant. All right. Well, I guess that's it for this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks everyone for watching or listening, and we'll see you again next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code AstroPodcast15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. 
where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline uh, basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year. The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwak.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org.